like uh, uh, First, I have to thank, uh, um, I have to, to tell you what the main character of this conference, and they are the directors that are listed here, and apart a number of local people, that is me, Sebastian Gold, Edgar Roldan, uh, Stefano Rufo, who is also CISA director, and Matteo Marzilli, all the other person here, including Stefano Rufo, are actually members of uh, our partner uh, um, uh, for the organization of this conference beyond ICTP, that is the uh, Statistical and Nonlinear Physics Division of the European Physical Society. For a reason that it will be clear, probably you know it, but it will be clear. So, and uh, we are pleased to have uh, here in presence a number of the representative, oops, sorry, a number of uh, representative of the board of, uh, of, um, of the, um, you know, the uh, EPS uh, Statistical and Nonlinear Physics Division. But in order to, uh, um, I think we have also the chairman, who is Professor Beck, who is going to tell us two words, I think right now, of welcome on behalf of the European Physical Society. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, my name is Christian Beck. I'm presently the chairman of the EPS Statistical and Nonlinear Physics Division. And a very warm welcome to everybody present in person here, but also to everybody joining us online. Uh, this is quite a unique conference, and because it's uh, based on a triple interaction of uh, EPS, CISA, and ICTP, and I think that is quite unique and has never happened before. So it's a great pleasure to be here. And for us from EPS, it's really great that we can be here in Trieste and enjoy the hospitality of CISA and ICTP. So um, uh, this is the third of a series of conferences on statistical physics of complex systems. The previous versions were in, in Krakow in 2017 and in Nordite in Stockholm in 2019. And we are now very glad to be here uh, in 2021. One of the highlights will of course be the award of the uh, Statistical and non Physics Prize of EPS. More on that tomorrow afternoon, but for now, a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And I think uh, uh, the director of CISA, Stefano Rufo, is connected from home and he would like to also give us some uh, uh, welcome uh, um, words. Stefano, please. Uh, good morning, every everybody. Uh, I'm Unfortunately, I could not join. My name is Stefano Ruffo. I'm the director of uh, CISA for uh, now for a few months more. And you, unfortunately, due to the family problem, uh, I, I'm unable to attend uh, today. Uh, indeed, uh, I think uh, 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 Christian is right uh, uh, that uh, this is really an unusual uh, conference. And I, I would like to, to stress that it is a hybrid conference and the hybrid um, form has been reached uh, uh, be within, uh, between uh, CISA and ICTP in a sort of new symbiotic partnership because, in fact, even the infrastructures that you are using today is a symbiotic between uh, CISA and ICTP. You don't realize it, but it is a, in the, indeed a symbiotic. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm really sorry not to be with you, and I hope that we can meet, we'll meet in the future very soon. And uh, I'm sure I will follow the conference online, and uh, uh, I think it, it's an excellent opportunity to show the various phases of uh, statistical and, and linear physics. Uh, have a nice talk. Okay, Stefano, thank you very much uh, for, for, your, for your words. So, while, so maybe I specify that, uh, as Stefano was saying, this room belongs to CISA, but the all electronic equipment has been set by ICTP. And actually this room has been renovated very recently. 
So I, we were also a bit unsure whether we managed to have the re room ready by today. So it was a bit of a thrilling experience. Anyhow. Okay, so let me, uh, let me also give you the highlights of the program. Of course, there is uh, uh, today the post session starting at four, which is completely virtual. So uh, by using this gather town, those of you who are not familiar with this gather town are, uh, welcome, are, are encouraged, welcome to see the booklet in which uh, uh, Sebastian Gold uh, summarize, uh, uh, summarizes all his knowledge about uh, uh, gather town. So I, I have still to read it actually, but I will do. So this means that also the people here, they will have to participate uh, uh, um, online. So this means that, uh, uh, that oh, sorry, that uh, I, mm, no, so sorry, because I'm not familiar. So they, they have to, please remember to use headphones. So you have to connect with your laptop to the internet. EduRome is working here. Use your headphones so you will navigate the poster session exactly as all the other participants from remote. And also, in order not to crowd this room, although the chance is very low, but there are a certain number of lecture rooms, one floor below, in which you can go and, uh, and uh, also work, discuss, but also attend the poster session, okay? Then the other highlight is uh, tomorrow, as uh, uh, Professor Beck said, starting at two, we will have the award of the EPS SNPD prize to our distinguished colleagues that will be introduced in due time by, by Christian. With this, uh, this said, uh, let me uh, give, uh, uh, remind uh, some practical matters for those who are physically present here. That is coffee and lunches will be served actually outside the room. And uh, uh, as you know, lunch will be given in the form of lunch boxes, which we, will, uh, we, we can withdraw there. So it's a takeaway. And uh, for eating lunch, the possibility is either to spread here or to go out. I mean, again, remember social distancing and so on and so forth. We have to comply with the rules that uh, we have learned uh, in the past uh, year and a half. You know? it's important recommendation, do not enter ICTP building because uh, uh, they have a different safety, safety measures, so we have, to, we have to stay at bay. And uh, remember also to wear face masks when you are inside the room or uh, inside the buildings. And uh, remember to keep on distance, to, to maintain social distance. This said, uh, again, thank you for joining either physically here or in person, I, we are really glad that uh, many of the speakers managed to come here. It's not a, an easy period. The traveling is difficult. Everything is uncertain. You never know which to go, documents you need to take with you. But thank you for coming. And uh, we hope that you enjoy the conference. Okay. So thank you very much. And this. Uh, Maybe in order to be sharp with the program, we, we, let's wait five minutes. And at half past nine, we will start with the first uh, uh, in-present talk by Raffaella Burioni. So while we said, so maybe uh, Raffaella, you can come here. Okay. Okay. Come 
So on. So before we start the, the, the scientific program, I forgot my colleagues were reminding me that concerning the lunch boxes, in principle, each lunch box should have your name on, on it. But in case this doesn't work, we never know. And you don't remember what you choose because I, I, I can tell you that I do not remember what I chose. Uh, there is a board outside the room which is written what was your choice, okay? So in case, but everything should be smooth, okay? Devo provare a parlare? Sì. Vediamo il microfono. Se provi un secondo a parlare dal microfono, questo dovrebbe essere. Ok, this is, this is to check the microphone. Can you hear me? Yes, that's a kind of echo, maybe. So I have to keep on speaking to check the microphone again. So maybe now. It's okay. Okay. So maybe I don't know because my watch is not really what's the time. Ah, okay. So let's wait. Okay, so uh, we start the scientific program, and so the first chairman of the session is going to be Raul Toral from uh, uh, Palma. Um, and who is a member of the board of uh, European of the statistical nonlinear physics division of the EPS, please. Okay. Good morning and welcome to this first session. First speaker will be Rafaela Burioni from Parma, from University of Parma. Uh, she's going to talk about these large fluctuations in anomalous transport and the big jump principle. You have 25 minutes. Okay, okay 25 plus five for questions. Last Okay. Okay. Is it okay. Well, again, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Rafael Burioni now has, a, has a first, the first talk about these last fluctuations in the normal transport on the big jump principle. Okay, whatever. Thank you very much. And uh, first of all, thank you. Thanks to the organizer for, for the invitation. And uh, as I am the first speaker, let me thank the organizer for the effort to organize this, uh, this meeting also in person, because uh, at least for me, it is uh, the first time I come to a real meeting after two years is like a kind of uh, I mean, uh, recovering. And uh, so thank you really, uh, deep thanks to, to try to organize this uh, I mean, hybrid, hybrid meeting. So uh, I will let me come to the topic. I will talk about a traditional topic in our in our I mean, group in uh, in Parma, which is anomalous transport, and I will talk about anomalous transport in connection with this big job principle, which we have been using in the last few years to to obtain several results related to 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 large deviation and large fluctuation in uh, in uh, systems 
with the um, fat tail distribution. So let me, um, the work that I will present is, has mainly um, been done in collaboration with Alessandro Vezzani and, uh, and Deli Bartai in Barilan and also with uh, uh, Wang Li Wang in Barilan as well, as part from uh, with the uh, Rico Baldi, the, the old part, and also with La Posso Toglia. La Posso Toglia? Oh, okay. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. No, it's much better. And, uh, uh, and, but uh, it comes from a series of, of results that we have uh, obtained with uh, Giacomo Gardenigo, Alessandro Saracino, and Angelo Gupiani and Stefano Leppi in, in Florence. So it's a, it's a long way. But I will, I will mainly talk about these, I mean, these uh, uh, papers which have been recently published, which are, I mean, in collaboration with uh, Alessandro Vezzani, Eli Barcai, and, and Juan Limon. So to, to illustrate this big jump principle, I will, Make an example. So this is a pre-COVID conference, as you can see. It's a picture that comes from, from the, our, I mean, previous life. And uh, suppose you are in a room and you want to measure the average height of the people come in the, in the, in the uh, people that are in the room. So you, you measure the average, and you find that this average is well above the average value that you expect in the population of a statistical physicist. In a, in, I mean, in the world, okay? So what is the typical configuration that you expect to find in the room in order to explain such a deviation with respect to the average value of the height in the room? Well, probably what, what happened in the room is that there are a bunch of people, I mean, many people, we, are, we have a height which is a little above the average, and then, okay, summing up all this contribution, that, I mean, are a little above the average, you obtain a fluctuation which is large. And this is the typical mega range that you expect in a situation where you, you, are, uh, you have random variable which have a thin tailed distribution, okay? Like the heights in the population typically, okay? So the large deviation is caused by many more small deviation all in the same direction, okay? But if I ask another question, for example, I measure the average rainfall, for example, here in Trieste in a month, and I find that this value is well above the, edge, uh, the average. And for example, I find that this month it rained a lot in Trieste. So what is the typical mechanism which has produced such a large deviation with respect to the average? Well, it's not the previous one because rainfalls are typically differently distributed. They are fat tail distributed. So probably what happened in, during this month is that in one day it rained a lot, but really a lot. And this large amount of rainfall took all the fluctuation with respect to the average. So this in a nutshell is the, what is the mathematics the literature I discovered is called the, the, big, the single big jump principle. And it is the situation where you experience in a stochastic process, in a, in a, in a random probability distribution, you, you experience a large deviation with respect to the average, but this average is not produced by a, by a set of accumulating deviation like in, in normal process, but a huge fluctuation, very large, okay? And this is the single big jump, okay? So, so typically, this, uh, this, uh, okay. Um, okay. No, no, okay. I oh, know I, I took the, okay. Ah, this is one. Hi, you this. Okay, okay. Uh, no. No, sorry. Okay. So this is for the. Ah, here it is. Sorry, I'm not. Okay. So uh, as I told you, uh, the single big example this is a situation where this far tail of the probability density of the observable that we are considering is dominated by a single very large contribution. Okay, and it is well known in the mathematical literature. For example, this, this nice paper in sixty sixty four by Sistakov, and uh, there are a lot of uh, I mean uh, mathematical results on this principle in uh, for EED random variables drawn from a fat tail distribution, but not only a fat tail distribution as a power law, which is a strongly fat tail distribution, but it, this, this, uh, this uh, contribution is also present when you have a sub-exponential distribution, which, which uh, this can be a much smoother uh, situation than a power law. Okay, and for example, this, this book, which is, um, I mean, uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, include many results, many mathematical results on the topic. So the typ typically it is stated like this, you the, it is uh, the observable that you are considering is the sum of this variable and you have that the probability. So the, all the, all the mean the probability, the, the entire statistics of the sum of this random variable 
is equivalent to the, to, the, to the statistics of the maximum of this variable when the value of this sum is large. So this uh, um, principle tells you something, well, really completely outside the real mob of a central limit theory, which is related to the bulk of the distribution. This principle tells you something of, uh, about the larger ratio with respect to the mean in the case of a fat, fat tail distribution. Sorry, I'm really, so, okay. Uh, sorry, but, okay, this one, this one. Okay, and the typical situation uh, is that is this one, okay, where you have, for example, um, um, power load distributed uh, distance, this there can be distances, so this could be a position, as you will see, because I will use the language of normal, normal transport. And uh, um, uh, in this case, you can uh, show quite easily that, for example, if the variables are identically distributed and extract and are drawn from this distribution, this is precisely what's going on. So the two uh, statistics are equivalent, okay? And uh, this principle has been extended to different uh, situations with form of co specific or of correlation in the foreign, um, foreign variable, but in this paper here, for example, but there are many people that this is really vast. Okay, and in the statistical physics literature, there is a, there is a I mean, a, a line of research which is really nice, which is related. This, uh, I mean, uh, occurrence of a large jump, so a, a huge contribution uh, uh, to, to the statistics, to a kind of transition which is a kind of condensation transition where the fluctuation they condense all in the same I mean uh, uh, event okay and it can be analyzed with a with a nice uh, mathematical setting by I mean using tools from statistical physics for example setting a kind of micro canonical approach that sets the, the, the I mean the the the, the, the the constraint for the sum. Okay, this is an example. You, you have a, this when the, when the variable are, of course, independent here. And uh, uh, oh, uh, with this uh, I mean, approach, you can obtain a very nice distribution, uh, very nice result that uh, I list, part of them I listed. So what, is, what, what do we want to do, do in, our, in, our, in our situation, which is related to anomalous transport, okay? Uh, and uh, I mean, to levy-like motions. So motion where uh, in some sense, levy distribution and uh, power law distribution are involved in the step distribution or in some other quantities. So the idea is the following. So we know that uh, th this should be the, the case. So when you have fat tail distribution, you should experience this kind of, uh, I mean, a contribution for a large jump. So the, the, the question that we ask, does the principle all for more complex fat tail problems, which are not, uh, I mean, uh, EED or, kind of, uh, of, I mean, of EED uh, related uh, situation. So for example, you, if you have a space time correlation in variables, you have, a, or have increments which are not independent. And the main point is that can we use this principle? So the fact that the contribution to the tail comes principally from a single jump, use it to obtain the form of the tail of the distribution. So this is more or less the approach. So what, what, we, what we did was to take as a test bed for our analysis, a series of Levy-like motion. So situation where you have a Levy distribution, so power law distribution, which are related to transport. Let me make for example, one of them is the Levy walk. So you have, for example, in one, one dimension, you extract your step from a Levy distribution, which is a power law distribution, for example, with, a, with an exponent which is between zero and two. So you, have, you, you have, don't have normal transfer in typically. Okay, so each step is covered with a, with a velocity plus, plus v, or v or minus V with probability one half, let's put it on a line for simplicity. So the position and the observable is the sum of the steps. Okay, with respect to the, the distance with respect to the origin. So the steps are, takes a time which is related to, to the fact that the, the velocity is finite and is, for example, constant, okay? And uh, the steps are uncorrelated, but of course, this is a correlation between a space uh, because uh, there is a, a time that is needed to, 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 you know, to, to make the, the jump. And uh, of course, there is a cutoff in the velocity uh, in, the, in, the, in the probability distribution because of course, the particle cannot go farther than uh, uh, V, uh, uh, multiplied by the time while you are observing the process. So it is a complex process. It's simple, but it is complex with respect to. And the levy flight would be the sum of power law independent distributed random variable, which I showed you before, where each step is, takes just 
one, uh, one, uh, one, uh, one, one unit time. This is a more physical process. So what you want to, to understand here is the distance from the origin at time t, so the probability distribution to find your particle at distance r from the origin at time t. This is a simple process which has been investigated in many settings, so we use it just to, to make an example of how we can use the big jump principle to obtain the form of the, of the probability distribution, but, but we have more, more much, we are more ambitious and for example, we wanted to analyze this uh, process, which is much more difficult, which is the levy lorentz gas. So the situation for the levy lorentz gas is different. You have a set of scatterer on the line, which are spaced according to a levy distribution. So the distance between the scatter is drawn from this distribution with the same parameter, but this time they are fixed in space. So it is a kind of quencher disorder in a physical sense, and you have a particle going through this structure, starting from a scattering site, this is a particular uh, choice for this process, okay, the non-equilibrium choice, and the particle starts from here, it goes through the, through the structure, and when it comes to a scatter, it is reflected or transmitted with probability one half, for example. So this is a much harder problem, okay, because the, the, the particle is moving in a in a, I mean, in a quenched, uh, in a quenched disorder situation. So once again, we are interested in the probability of finding the particle at least an R at time T, okay, on this structure, okay. And uh, this is a, a nice, uh, I mean, uh, model because it is a model for diffusion in, uh, I mean, it can be used as a model for diffusion in combustion flow for, for diffusion in porous media where you have, uh, I mean, these gaps, which are the holes of that, uh, where, the, where the particle go through. So this uh, model is, is, is really something which uh, uh, takes into account the geometrical setting of the holes on, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in transport, okay. And, but we got interested in this problem because of this uh, nice experiment uh, done in uh, some years ago, uh, which was uh, testing the, the, I mean, the, the scattering of light and the transmission of light in a, uh, in a, 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 a packet, in a set of packet spheres with radii which are distributed according to the Levy distribution. So it was a kind of engineered Levy glass, what called but Levy glass because it was uh, I mean, made of glass, okay, with the scattering regions where you have, you see black regions, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, ballistic uh, uh, transport inside the hole. And so this is the, 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 the mathematical model that we did to analyze this situation. So, I mean, the level of gas is a, is a paradigmatic situation where you have, uh, I mean, um, uh, 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 levy distribution, so fat tail distribution for the variables, but the variables are certainly correlated. Okay, sorry, um, uh, uh, once again. Okay, are certainly correlated because, of course, during the motion, the, 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 it, it, when the particle experiences a scatter near a, a very big hole, then it can be reflected and find again the hole. And so it's certainly a very difficult situation to study from the point of view of correlation of the variable which are involved or the fat tail variable that are involved in this situation. And, and it has very be studied. Uh, so what is the situation in general? So I would, uh, let me just say that in this situation where you have a novel transport, uh, the PDF of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the position is not Gaussian as in normal transport, but still we are lucky because we can recover in this situation a scaling form. So the, the probability distribution as a scaling form, the bulk part of the distribution as a scaling form, and something which is very interesting uh, to know is the scaling length of the distribution, which grows with time. And this is something which characterizes the process and gives uh, an idea of how, how the, 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 the distribution is made in the bulk. But in general, of course, you have the tails, as I told you, in process like this. So in general, you have, uh, you, you should be more careful and, and say that this probability distribution as a part which is related to the bulk, so at distance which are inside the, the scaling length of, the, uh, of, the, of your distribution, and the part which are we call B, okay, just because we, we call it B, and uh, which uh, tell you something about the uh, position of your particle when uh, the particle is very far away from the center of the, di the distribution. So you have this part, and these are both inter very important in, the, in, in analyzing your process, because in general, the probability distribution is like this. You have this leading contribution, which is related to the bike, as I told you. This is the tail, 
which is very far from the, from the center of the distribution. Of course, this part is as a zero measure from the point of view of the probability distribution, but when you, when you compute the moments of the distribution, of course, this part can be very important because it can change the uh, behavior of the higher moment of your distribution. So knowing that, it's important to know the, 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 the behavior of the higher moment. So the idea is, can we uh, give a, a precise form to this formability to distribution when you are in situation like let the levy walk or much better the levy Lorentz gas, which is a much more difficult situation from the point of view of the correlation of variable. So uh, the idea that we, we took is the following. So we assume that in this situation, the principle holds and that the contribution to the tail is produced by a single big jump that occurs at a certain time during the process why it goes on at a certain time, okay? So the main idea to, to, to extract the contribution of this large deviation is to build the process and to analyze precisely the process, the process that can produce such a large fluctuation. So we assume that it holds, we don't have a proof of that, of course, for such important problem, not for a levy goal, where there is a, there is a proof somehow, but for example, for the levy Lorentz gas, we don't have a proof that, that, that this uh, big jump principle holds, okay? So we, 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 we suppose that it holds, and the idea physically, not to enter into, into the calculation, I will show you some, but the idea of the, of the, of the estimate of this big T is the following. So you, you divide the process in two scales, two scales from the point of view of, of time and distance. So one, is, uh, one scale is what happens inside the times and the distance which are related to the bulk of the distribution. So, okay. so the, the, the particle moves in, in spaces and time which are related, which are in, characterized by the bulk of the distribution. And during this, this motion inside the bulk, let's say, um, of the distribution, the particle is trying to produce the event that takes the particle outside the distribution. Okay, so during the, um, the, the motion in the, in the bulk of the distribution, the particle is accumulating, uh, I mean, uh, trials to make this very big jump. Okay, so we use the bulk of the distribution to estimate the rate at which this uh, trial of uh, doing this very big jump is made, okay, uh, very, very roughly, and then to estimate the probability of going very far from the center distribution, we analyze in detail the process that in a single jump takes the, the particle, the bunch of particle outside the distribution. So as you can, you can see, it's an heuristic process which we, we managed to do in, in a several process, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, uh, it, it, it has a kind I mean, of, of, of I mean, understanding the typical process that produce this, um, this large fluctuation. So it is complex, of course, for example, in a levy low gas, the, the process is complex and it's very difficult to calculate its contributions, it's complex, but it is a single process. So if you have a chance to get uh, an information on what is going on in the far tail of the distribution. So it's really the, the other uh, extreme of, I mean, the, the usual large deviation where you we really sum up the, the, I mean, the, the exponentially depressed contribution of all these very tiny deviation with respect to the mean. Here you just, just say, you do the opposite. You just say, look at one process and you make your calculation on that. And then of course, uh, we, we validate this, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, result with, with simulation, but I mean, it, it's, uh, there are indications that it, it also, of course, and this is a very important uh, uh, in, uh, uh, thing to say, uh, in general, just because this, this deviation and this, uh, this large uh, fluctuation, let me say, is uh, uh, produced by one single, one process, okay, or a series of process that contributes to just to do very good jump, it is very process specific. So we do not expect a universal behavior in general in this situation. But uh, of course, uh, the, we will have uh, uh, non analytics and uh, very, um, um, a, a lot of, of I mean, uh, details which are related to the process itself and not to the class of uh, variable, like, for example, in the case of usual, usual statistics and usual division. Okay, so let me come to what we did. So we applied this, uh, this approach to many uh, situations, which are more or less related to, to I mean, uh, um, fat tailed in the sense of superconnected distribution. So we, we applied to levy walk. This was known. This, uh, the, the, the part was uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the large base of the fat tail of the levy walk was already known. It had been calculated by, uh, I mean, uh, to, to, 
2014, uh, and we re-derived it very easily to check that this, this, uh, this, this, uh, I mean, uh, this approach uh, old. And we, we used to, to, to analyze a, a, a map with a mapping of the Levy Wolf, a, 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 I mean, a model of motion of cold atoms. And uh, of course, we used to, to estimate the, 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 the large deviation in a one dimensional Levy Lorentz gash. Uh, with a strongly, of course, heterogeneous disorder. And recently we used also uh, to, this, uh, this process also to, 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 to extract the same uh, contribution in a one dimensional Lorentz gas, where now the spacing is very mild and it is a stretch and exponential. So it's not an extreme situation like in, in the lovely Lorentz where you have really a huge deviation in spacing. So you, it's really powerful to obtain the exact form of the scaling function. So it's not just the scaling length, but the exact form of the scaling function. Okay. And, um, and we used also for, for Levy Wolf with, uh, with memory and so also with, uh, with a model with acceleration, the deceleration along the step. But every time you have a, a Levy Wolf with some kind of modification, it's, it's really easy to use it because you have the Levy Wolf, is, it's easier because every step is, uh, I mean, independent from the other. And the correlation comes on only from the coupling between space and time. While in the, uh, in the quench disorder, like in the Levy Wolf class, the situation is much more difficult. So let me go to the situation. So let me tell you how do you do the calculation in practice in a nutshell, for example, in the Levy work. So suppose you have a Levy work, take uh, alpha between one and two because, because for alpha between zero and one, uh, so there are some kind of uh, uh, problems in applying in this, uh, this approach. Okay, in this case, you have a scaling, fun a scaling length which can be calculated easily and uh, also the scaling function is not, so the bulk of the distribution is no, you have a software diffusion. So you have a finite velocity, so extracting a length is like extracting time, so you, you can really uh, shift in the two formulas. So what is uh, the, the motion that we expect that the, the, the particle is taken in this case. So uh, up, up to a certain time that we call TW is like a waiting time, the worker takes us see at this time that we have to, to I mean, sum up all, all, on all, all over possible, all, all over possible TW, this part, particle takes this step that takes the particle well outside the, the, the typical length described on the scaling length at that time t. So uh, up to that time, Given that the, the whole contribution is produced by the disjunct, of course the particle is moving, but it's moving in a very, very uh, small region that we can completely neglect with respect to the, to the, uh, to the, 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 the whole distribution. So the, the, the motion of the particle is really simple. So it's like it is stuck, stuck in, a, uh, uh, in, 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 in the origin up to TW, and then at TW, it takes the step. Okay, so it's, it's very easy to analyze in the case of the, in case of, of the Levy work. And uh, uh, now you have to consider all the process that at TW takes the particle in the place where we are moving, we are measuring the distribution, which is distance R at time T. So if you, if you reflect that, you know, there are two possible processes, only two possible processes that takes the particle there. So the first one is the, that the worker take a step of a, of a length which is higher than, longer than, the, the, than, the, than the, your R, okay? And of course, so the particle is still traveling when, when, you are, when you're here. And they are, and this is the first contribution. And the second distribution is when the particle take this step, which is precisely a, a, a landing at where you measure your uh, probability, your distribution. Of course, it is not exactly so because you have the fact that the particle is moving within L of T, but this is neglectable, negligible with respect to the big jump. So, okay, these are, these are two very simple process. You can uh, uh, compute the, the, I mean, the, 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 the probability really in few steps and you find the form of the, Levy, of the tail of the Levy work, which had been obtained with a very long calculation by Eli and, and co-worker by uh, Denis Overa in uh, 2014, by a moment resumption uh, involving infinite densities. Okay, and so this is the form. And the nice fact about the way we, we compute it is that you, uh, you recognize precisely that the two contribution, the two parts that you find in the, are related to two, to two different physical processes. Okay, so something which is dif difficult to recognize in the case where you resum all the moment like in the period. So mm, let me go straight. So what happens in the level of gas? So in the level of gas, we were able to compute. So the scaling length of the bulk of the distribution was known somehow. And uh, for example, you see that here, you, you see simulation, you see that, that this part is scaling very well. So the, 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 the 
for every alpha, the, 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 the bulk of the distribution is well described by the scalar length. But what is the form of the tail in the levy Lorentz gas, which is, as I told you, is a strongly correlated problem. Okay. And so the situation in the levy Lorentz gas is somehow similar, but the, the motion that you have to imagine for your particle in the levy structure is the following. So the particle starts from the origin, it moves, and at, while uh, it moves from the center uh, from, from the origin, it, it, it has the, the chance to hit one of the scatterer, which is followed by the large gap. So this is the typical motion. So it's moving in, 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 in of L of T, and during this L of T, the particle is accumulated trial to produce this very big jump. And when the particle is this very big jump, it enters the jump. And when you measure its position in the middle of the jump, of course, this can be produced by all the possible reflection that are, uh, um, that, okay, that, um, are experienced by, the, by, the, by this particle. How we are sure that it is reflected because we are in 1D. Okay, and of course we are sure that, that uh, in uh, in short time the particle is affected because of the recurrence of the of the of the of the random walk in YD. So of course you build this process, you sum all the contribution of this reflection, which you see are difficult, but not that difficult as the as the I mean analyzing the motion in the wall structure, and you find a very specific, a strange form of the tail, which, as you can see, has some non-analysis inside because these are related to the reflection. Okay, so you find non-analytic point in, in one over n where n is odd. So this, you see the simulation is really, really precise. So this is the precise form of the, the scaling form of the, of, the, of, the, of the probability distribution. So as you can see, it is model specific and very, and very powerful, okay? And uh, of course, from this, you can compute. <laughs> moments okay and uh, these are very very well uh, i mean reproduced by the by the, this uh, this uh, probability distribution that enters in the calculation of the model and of course you can do the same with for example a sub exponential uh, spacing in uh, in the in the structure uh, this is not the, the 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 situation that you are going to expect because here the, the, it's really for example if you take a a, a stretched distribution it's really hardly hard to recognize the spacing of uh, of the of the scatterers in the Lorentz gas with respect to the standard distribution. And this is the form that you can calculate with the same, uh, um, with the same uh, uh, technique. And here you see that you find uh, uh, V uh, uh, multiplied by the time, which is the scale, of course, of the big jump. So this is another scaling length which comes into play. And here you have L tilde, which is the, the, the original scale, which is present in a stretch exponential. So you have three scales in the profit in this case, which you can compute quite easily uh, I mean, in this, this distribution. So uh, just to sum up, let me tell you that, uh, I mean, so uh, the, 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 the application of this technique of reconstructing the process, uh, the specific single big jump in this fat tail process is very powerful. Of course, it needs a kind of, uh, it needs a, 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 I mean, a, I mean, a, a comprehension of the physical process that uh, produced this very big jump. But once you assume that it holds, you can concentrate your attention on the uh, calculation of that particular uh, process. And it is probably going to give you a, a strong information on the, on the, mm, on the, on the, I mean, on the tail of the distribution. Of course, uh, the, the important part and this, this contribution is very specific. So it can, be used, it can be used also to analyze the details of the property just because this, this big jump has inside the, uh, I mean, the, the details of the process. It's not a universal quantity. So it is very powerful, but as I told you, it is heuristic. So we have to determine the process of the jump and the jumping rate. And uh, uh, of course, uh, we, we don't know what is the class of process uh, where, where we can apply the, this principle in, in general. And of course, uh, the nice idea is to use it for experimental data and to recognize the contribution of, uh, of the biggest jump in uh, a strong deviation, large deviation in, 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 in real process and real data. Thank you. Sorry for okay, that. thank you, Rafael. Now it's question time. Um, if anybody from the audience has have a question, just raise your hand. And if anyone from Zoom, I think you can simply unmute yourselves and ask the question to see how it works. Any question from the audience? Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think I, I put it in the chat. What would be the physical meaning of the alpha parameter, if there is any? Sorry, you mean the alpha in the in the, the power law? Yes. Ah, of course, it, 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 it is uh, the, the parameter that describes the statistic of your jump. If alpha is greater than two, of course, uh, if you measure the, 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 the second moment of the distribution, this is finite. So you expect that the, the, the probability distribution is abstracted for a central limit theorem to the Gaussian distribution. If the uh, alpha is between one and two, you have a divergent second moment and, uh, sorry, uh, a finite second moment and uh, a diverging first moment, so it is another kind of distribution. So it's really the, the parameter that tells you something about the statistics of your of your uh, microscopic variables so, like that can be, on, of course, the, the steps in the Levy walk or uh, some other quantities in general that can be related to any quantity. So it is the parameter that tells you how uh, uh, how uh, uh, fat is your distribution in some sense if it is a power law. In the case of a Walby distribution, the alpha is also uh, telling you uh, which kind of process you are considering because alpha between zero and one is a Weibull distribution. Alpha equals one is a Poisson and alpha greater than one is like a, show, a, a thin tail distribution. So when you use the Weibull distribution, you can experience all the, all, you know, all the, 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 the regimes. So alpha is, uh, is describing the statistics, the fact statistic, the large statistic of your, of your uh, microscopic variables. If, if Thank you. So I have a question here. So morally, how, how similar <laughs> is to, to the problem of uh, uh, leaving a potential well? Uh, sorry, can you... so, so imagine you have a, in equilibrium, in principle, you could do the same in, in an equilibrium situation, which you have a potential well and the particle has to jump out of it. So you... Yes, you can do it. You can do it. For example, suppose you have a statistic of, of jump, which uh, statistic. So suppose that the jump outside the well is not produced by many small deviations, but is produced by a, a big jump. This is the case, for example, if you have... A, uh, and also, I uh, don't know, uh, 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 a stochastic process with a, with a noise, uh, with an additive noise, which is not uh, uh, short correlated, but this is a lady light distribution with colored noise, then you have indication that the, 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 X, the going out from the, from, the, from the trap, I mean, for the well, is produced by a single jump. And in that case, you can apply the, I mean, the, the, this type of uh, reasoning as well. So every time you, you, there is indication that your process is produced by a single jump, and this is the case every time you have, uh, I mean, fast statistics uh, in the simple case or in more complex case, I mean, the quenched, I mean, uh, fat distribution, uh, you are morally, uh, I mean, you can morally use it. Okay. okay. Any questions? Okay, I have one. Uh, when you talk about this comparison with numerical simulations, yes. how difficult, what kind of technique you use to do these simulations? Oh, to it's, rare it, events? Well, it was, um, I mean, a standard simulation of random walks. The, 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 uh, the most, the Levy walk is not difficult. It's, it's, a, it's a very easy simulation. But the rare events no, I mean, the, 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 the Levy Lawrence gas is very difficult because to, to me, to see this, uh, this I mean, uh, far tail, you really have to build a very large structure. So we have to use several, uh, I mean, tricks to obtain a very large structure and average over trajectories and average over different uh, environments as well. But I mean, of course, this is, a, this is a, a, a statistic of rare events. So you have to produce these very big jumps that is, uh, is I mean, giving the contribution. So of course, uh, I mean, uh, it was uh, difficult to, to, to build a structure. That, that's the main point in the, in the level of rents. For the wider distribution, it's much easier. For okay. Uh, okay, we stop here and we thank the speaker again. Thank you so much. Move to the next talk. Which is also an, uh, a conference where you? in person by Gabriel Salierno. No, 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 by John Corbell. Should be I having the program. Okay. This is John Corbel from the Medical University of Vienna. And he'll tell us about this thermodynamics of the structure forming systems.
you have 15 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, do you hear me? Great. Thank you, everyone. Just... Okay, so um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank the organizing for having me. Uh, I would like to present our recent um, research that was published in Nature Communications that is about thermodynamics of structure forming systems. And this has been done in collaboration with my colleague, Simon Lindner, who is the PhD student now at the Medical University of Vienna and two senior guys, Rudy Hanel and Stefan Turner from the Medical University of Vienna and Complexity Science Hub. Uh, if you want to see my slides, they are available at slides.com slash Jan Korbel. Okay, so um, in classical statistical physics or uh, thermodynamics, we usually consider systems that are in a way simple, so molecules or atoms. But what we know is that in many cases, like in chemistry or um, biochemistry, other also in social applications, these, these elementary particles, elementary uh, elements of the system form structures. So molecules form atoms, clusters of colloidal particles. We have biopolymers or micelles. And what we wanted to do is to study thermodynamics of such systems. And especially for the case where um, the system is small, uh, we cannot do it through the standard approach of using the ground canonical ensemble because the particle fluctuations in that case are too big. And in case we have a clo small closed system that forms these structures, I will show you that uh, there is some correction to Shannon entropy that describes this, um, these systems much better. And I will also show several physics application on the real physical systems. Uh, there are not only possible applications, but maybe uh, quite interesting. And also I will make a step beyond equilibrium uh, statistical physics and show you some uh, results in fluctuation theorems for these systems. Okay, so let's start with a very simple toy model. It's coin model. So I have a coin, it has head or tail. So I toss a coin and it can have two states, head or tail. And let's say I have n coins. Then I say I have a simple assumption that these coins are magnetic. So if these, if two coins stick together, they form a new state. Um, one can see it as a molecule or whatever. And now I would like to show you that this structure that is brought into the system is very important. And one of the reasons how one can see it that, that if you start calculating the states of the system, so if you have non-magnetic coins, you know that there are two to n states where n is number of coins, but this system, when we allow this uh, interaction between coins, so this, this bond states grow super exponentially, so faster than exponential. I mean, this, this, is, this growth is just slightly bigger, so it's n to n, so it's like e to n log n, but it's still super exponential. And this extra amount of states uh, gives us this emergent uh, phenomena that uh, wouldn't exist in the subsystems or in the systems without these structures. Let's start um, counting this, these systems. So what we can do is that we can follow the famous formula by Boltzmann. And if we want to really calculate the thermodynamics of such systems, we basically take his formula for entropy. So we take basically the logarithm of the sample space or configuration space if you want. Uh, so now our uh, task is to calculate how many, what is the multiplicity of this system. The multiplicity means how many microstates correspond to same mesostate. And the microstate is really uh, what, so if you have particles, if you have coins, if the first toss is head or tail or head or tail, or if these two come together. The mesostate on the other hand is just the histogram or the number of states at given point. So how many coins are at tail position? How many coins are at 
head position. And we don't care about whether it's first or second or third or whatever coin. So let's have a simple example. So microstates can be three coins, head, tail, head, tail, head, 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 tail. This corresponds to the same mesostate where you have two coins in head state, one coin in tail state, and the multiplicity is three. Similarly enough, uh, in, if we have one coin in head state and the other are bond together, considering that, that basically this bond state is just single state, so we don't say anything about, for example, that whether the first is up or the second is down or vice versa, just for simplicity, then the number of these microstates is again three, corresponding to the same mesostate. And now the question is, these were two simple examples, is there any general formula that gives us the answer, what is the multiplicity of a system? And the uh, answer is yes. And we do it quite similarly to the case of where we have regular multinomial systems described by Shannon slash Gibbs entropy. So basically what we say is that we consider a mesostate. So we say we have a histogram and we calculate how many uh, microstates belong to this one. So what we do is that we make the permutations of all the particles at all places. Or we say that first particle is in head, second is in tail, uh, third is in bond, and then we permute them all together. But of course, these all permutations give us just uh, too many states because some of them are overrepresented. So if I say if first is in tail and second is also in tail, then it doesn't matter when the first or second is tail. So then we have to divide by this, uh, this number of overrepresentation. So for the first example, basically we do all the permutations. So this is all in the colors. So we say first is in head or second is in head or third is in head and the same for the second and third place. And then we see that the, this, this permutations one, two, three and two, one, three belong to the same microstate head, head, tail because it doesn't matter whether the first or the second is in head. So what we see is that, that we get three factorial uh, permutations altogether, but only three of them belong to distinct microstates. Similarly, we can do it for the second case. Here, uh, it's just a coincidence that it has the same number of states, but you see that, that for example, the, the red, the first one, one, two, three, uh, red permutation, and the second one, one, three, two, orange permutation, belong to the same microstate. Good, uh, this can be easily generalized. So the general procedure is that we take the Nij molecules, so uh, molecules at state i of size j, we permute the molecules, this gives us uh, the Nij factorial permutation, and then we also have to permute all the particles in the molecules, so to say. And this is the J factorial to Nij permutations. You can try it uh, by yourself uh, and you will get the same number. The total multiplicity for this case, where we have three particles of size three is 280. And the general formula is N factorial over this product of Nij factorial J factorial Nij. And uh, from now I will be showing the difference between the standard uh, Boltzmann uh, or Gibbs entropy, this multinomial case by uh, this light blue color. So you see that in, when, when the size of the particles is one, then the J factor is one, and this doesn't, doesn't count. So, so this would lead to, to ordinary Shannon entropy or Boltzmann Gibbs entropy as we know. Uh, but in this case where we allow these molecules, we see that this is something that adds up to this uh, factor. And if you start calculating it, uh, maybe I can mention that it seems to be something new. Actually, it was already discovered by, by Boltzmann himself in this 1884 paper where we was investigating the chlor and uh, hydrogen uh, forming the chloride hydrogen. And his formula is for this special case, very similar. Unfortunately, this paper was written in German and it was somehow forgotten. It has almost no, almost no citations, uh, but already in 19th century, these formulas were known. Uh, if you start calculating these entropies, you will see that it's something that um, has the form of the Shannon entropy, where is this P log P. Uh, here we have to add a correction that really corresponds to the size of the molecules. 
and makes the entropy non-symmetric in the, in, in, in the probabilities. What you can do is that you can also introduce finite interaction range. So let's say only particles in certain region can interact and then you can introduce concentration. And then you get the equilibrium distribution which looks like Boltzmann one, except for the case that there is this alpha J and it means that for calculating the partition function, I cannot just simply calculate it. I have to uh, solve this normalization equation where I have the to sum over all the states and there's this E to alpha J. And if you think about it, it's just a polynomial equation in, in E to minus alpha of the, uh, of the order of the maximum uh, size of the molecule. So it means that unless you have molecules of maximum size two, three, maybe four, you cannot solve it analytically. You have, to, you have to do some numerics because we don't know the general formulas for solution of polynomial equations, but doesn't matter. So in this case, you just have to calculate. You can not calculate the partition function directly, but we have to do it numerically. Here I just mentioned that, that although it seems quite different, uh, it fulfills all these uh, common axiomatic schemes, except for the case that it's not symmetric in when you relabel the, uh, the, the event. So it's not symmetric in the probabilities, which makes sense. And also it's not maximized by the uniform distribution, which is the consequence of it. But it makes sense because the states are conceptually different. It, it's really different when you have a free particle or when you have a molecule. So you cannot swap them easily. This gives you another state, really another physics. So uh, that's, that's one point. And this is what I uh, was talking before. We were comparing this with the usual approach in chemistry with the grand canonical ensemble where you have the article, uh, particle reservoir. So you have the, the reserve particle reservoir for each type of particle. So for single particles, for molecules of size two, three, four, et cetera. And then you adjust your, uh, your chemical potentials such that mass action law is satisfied. And for large, uh, larger systems, relatively larger systems, it corresponds quite well. It fits quite well. This is the specific heat that you can see depending on the temperature. But for smaller systems, we can see some deviations. So especially for small systems and low concentrations, it's useful if you, if you do these closed systems to use our approach or this approach. And now I will sh quickly show you some applications. One application is one application is is, is in self assembly of Janus particles. Janus was a Roman god with two faces, so Janus particle is also a particle that has kind of two faces or two halves. So one is hydrophobic and one is charged. So if these hydrophobic parts go uh, like face to each other, they get attracted and form a cluster. And if the charged parts go uh, face each other, they get repulsed. And and People were uh, also experimentally investigating this and also numerically, and they saw that under certain circumstances, particles form big clusters. This can be formalized by so-called Kern Frankel model. So we have the hard sphere model, and uh, this basically tells you uh, which is what is the range of angles that uh, that need to be to uh, to attract the other particles. The Janus particles, so there is this particle coverage. Uh, Janus particles has this coverage exactly 0 0.5. It means that the two hemispheres are really the same. And there are some other cases. And what we did is that we calculated the, the phase diagram uh, depending on concentration and temperature. And we saw that there are three phases. So there's fluid phase where we have three particles. Uh, there's condensed phase where we have really large clusters. Uh, and there is a coexistence phase where we have both large clusters and fluid particles. And this kind of corresponds to what people were observing experimentally. Another application is now in like more um, condensed matter. Uh, so we have the curry weiss model or the fully connected easing model uh, where we just say each particle interacts with each other, but there is a chance that they form molecules and then they don't feel neither spin-spin interaction nor the magnetic field. And then what you see is that uh, you can see that in, in, in normal uh, easing model, there is a second order phase transition. In this case, 
what you see is that, that the second order phase transition becomes first order phase transition and the critical temperature or the Curie temperature is decreased and decreases with the, with the size of the molecules. So you see that allowing this um, extra state completely changes the, the nature of the phase transitions of the systems. And now very quickly about going beyond equilibrium. So if we consider normal classical linear Markov uh, evolution described by master equation and detailed balance, which looks slightly different because the distribution also looks different, then you get very nice formula. So you see that the second law of thermodynamics holds for these systems. So this is, this is good. And then also we can derive the detailed fluctuation theorem where the, the, the sigma is the entropy, trajectory entropy production plus the change of the initial size of the particle and the finite size of the particle. So there is some correction for this uh, case, but you can again uh, derive all of these nice um, Syst uh, all of these nice results from stochastic thermodynamics. And with that, I would like to end. Uh, this is basically what we've seen. And now I would like to thank you for attention. Thank you for the talk, for keeping your time. Are there any questions from the audience? One over there. Uh, and my question is if uh, the corrections that you get for the for the entropies can be related with the mutual information between the particles okay good question we haven't investigated basically yes because what you what you see is that that you cannot decompose systems of n particles into two systems of n half particles let's say and these these distribution will not be independent because then you basically cannot consider this this mutual state. So it's not just about the maybe correlations or mutual information. It's about this emergence of this extra state that you cannot see from the subsystems. But in a way you could maybe quantify it by quantities like mutual information. Uh, thank you. You showed us uh, in one of your last slides there are logarithmic corrections, right? If you can yeah, the, uh, with what you have written in, in blue. Yes. Uh, yes. So how, how big are these corrections in typical experimental situations? Is it really something very so, relevant? So, so it's basic, basically, um, these corrections is that this, the, the J is the size of the cluster that the particle belongs at the beginning, size of the cluster that the particle belongs in the end. I can imagine that, that they can be quite large when you start in, in like single particle and going to big clusters. So I, I haven't measured it, I haven't calculated it exactly, but they can be in certain situations quite non negligible. Another question from here? Hi, I'm Giuseppe Gonnella. You showed uh, something about active particles mm -hmm. at a certain point. Uh, um, May I ask if uh, you are able uh, with your calculation or ev your evaluation of entropy to, to, to calculate a sort of phase diagram? You did something mm -hmm. like that for Giuliano's particle. And uh, the question is uh, if you have compared this with one coming uh, from simulation or, or other methods. Yeah, uh, so we, this is, what we used is just a basic model. Of course, if you have the real, um, particles they are the phase diagrams are more complex so there are different uh, phases of, of solid different structures whether it creates polymers or etc what we did is just we edit very simple Hamiltonian that just get, tells you whether these two uh, whether the particles are in a in condensed way or in a fluid phase we would need to do some other more complicated calculations that would probably not be tractable uh, doing semi-analytically where you only uh, solve for this alpha, but we would need to do some numerical simulations like, um, I don't know, this, this um, Grand Canonical Monte Carlo simulations or these, these things. But in principle, it would be possible. Actually, 
the, the community is, is already kind of using the same entropy. They found it in a different way, but they, they also, they are already using it in a way. Okay. Any other questions? Any questions from the Zoom attendees? Just unmute yourself if you have any questions. Okay. If not, we stop here. We thank the speaker again. Thank you. I'll move to the next one. This is Sarah Los here from ICTP. And she'll talk about irreversibility, heat, and information flows induced by non reciprocal interactions. So, are you ready? Okay, you have 20 minutes. But now it's not, I mean, it looks now it's not okay. It's not in the pocket because you have a screenshot. Yeah, yeah, they are looking at. Okay, then I do it like this. You can use the Okay. Zoom will not see this one. Ah, okay. Um, okay, then I think I do it like this. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to tell you today a little bit about this uh, recent work and um, Thank you everybody for coming. Um, so I'm presenting some work that I did during my PhD at Technical University of Berlin together with Sabine Klapp. And now I'm postdoc at ICTP and I'm continuing working on similar ideas together with Edgar Roldan. Um, so I want to start with telling you what are non-reciprocal interactions. Um, because in most parts of physics, you will only encounter reciprocal interactions. And this is true for any kind of fundamental forces. So these are the type of interactions that are representable as um, derivatives of an interaction Hamiltonian and that thus automatically fulfill Newton's third law, axial equals reaxial. So for example, for a mechanical coupling, two beads coupled by a spring, that would always be the case. And the fact that these interactions are representable by an interaction Hamiltonian is a very handy from a theoretical point of view. For example, from that property, um, you can derive the equilibrium distribution uh, despite the system being nonlinear and having many degrees of freedom. And you can also derive the fundamental laws of thermodynamics. For example, the change of internal energy of the system would be given by the change of the Hamiltonian. And that could be due to work applied to the system or heat dissipation. And as you all know, in stochastic thermodynamics, these ideas are generalized to the fluctuating scales. So here heat would be a functional of an individual fluctuating trajectory, but uh, the, uh, the 
<clears throat> on average, the same laws hold. As an example, if um, we couple these two beads here to two heat bars at different temperatures, um, we will easily find that, um, ah, that there is um, a heat flux whenever there is a temperature gradient and the direction of that heat flux would always be going from the hot side to the cold side, as you all know. However, in some systems, you can also encounter non-reciprocal interactions. This is, for example, true in active matter. You can also find them in uh, complex plasmas or in computer systems. If you look at logically um, operating systems, uh, the interactions, of course, don't have to fulfill Newton's third law. Um, and uh, as an example, uh, you can imagine a line of pedestrians walking. In this case, the green person would certainly react to what the gray person is doing, but the gray person would not necessarily react to what the green person is doing. And um, in this case, we have a non-reciprocal interaction. These interactions um, can also be realized in recent experiments on the fluctuating scale. For example, here, um, a reciprocal a non reciprocal interaction between colloidal particles is realized with the help of optical feedback and um, in this paper. Um, we asked the question, what are the thermodynamic implications of such a non reciprocal coupling on the uh, fluctuating scale. So, in order to address this question, what do we do, uh, we take a very simple toy model. The most simple scenario, you have two uh, linearly coupled systems uh, which are subject to noise and um, they are also subject to linear restoring forces. So you can imagine two colloidal particles, each one in a trap, and then there is this non-reciprocal linear coupling between them. And um, for um, Whenever the off diagonal elements um, have different values, we have non reciprocal coupling. In the special case that they have the same value, uh, we re recover the original um, mechanical model, so they are coupled by a spring. And then uh, in the two situations that one of the off diagonal elements nullifies, this <clears throat> model. Um, uh, reduces to, to two models which are actually known from the literature. So in the case that this um, A10 nullifies, this model uh, resembles an active einstein uhrenberg particle. So in this case, X0 would behave like the position of an act uh, active particle, and X1 would be an auxiliary variable that mimics the effect of a self-propulsion mechanism such as a flagellum. And in the other case, um, this model resembles a model known from the literature for a cellular sensor. So in this case, X0 would be some chemical concentration which is sensed by a cellular sensor and XY, uh, X1 would be the state of the cellular sensor. Um, yeah, so the first question that we ask is what is the dynamics seen by the marginal observer in this case? So um, it's no surprise that you have a non Markovian process here if you only um, consider X0. So if you trace out X1, then you will get um, a non Markovian equation for X0, which contains a colored noise due to this um, no uh, noisy process um, in X1. Um, and it also contains uh, a force which is in fact a delay force. So this is now a force that depends on the history of X naught. And it is only present if, each, if both off diagonal elements are non-zero. So not in the case of the active einstein unberg particle and not in the case of the cellular sensor. So in all other um, cases, we have some sort of delay force. So in these situations, this model can resemble a a system where X would be um, a system that is subject to a feedback controller X1 and it um, applies um, time delayed feedback force on X0. So um, now considering the thermodynamics, sorry, is that always has a some delay when I click. 
Um, yeah, so considering the thermodynamics, um, we consider, for example, the heat dissipation of both variables, and we find um, that the heat dissipation is in general non-zero, so that should be the uh, average heat dissipation of x naught. Sorry, it's written wrong here. And um, so this is no surprise. The system reaches a non-equilibrium steady state due to the non-reciprocal interaction. We cannot reach a state of thermal equilibrium. However, then there are two special cases. Um, so first of all, there is a situation where we do find a pseudo equilibrium state despite the non-reciprocity. And in fact, it is, um, we can find it if there's a certain condition for the non-reciprocal strength uh, as compared to the temperature gradient in the system. And uh, then we find that there is no net heat flow in the system, no irreversibility, detailed balance is fulfilled. So I think this is a quite unusual state um, because in a sense, we find here that the two drivings, so the temperature gradient and the non-reciprocity can compensate each other. And we still um, obtain a state of equilibrium. And I don't know if this is something that somebody else has seen in another system. I would be very interested in seeing that because I found it very unusual. And then uh, a second thing which is quite unusual is um, that if the strength of the non-reciprocity is higher than the temperature gradient, we can even find heat flows uh, from the cold to the hot side. So in this case, uh, different from the usual scenario, you can extract energy from the cold bath, pass it through the coupling and release it at the hot side. So if you let the system run, um, it acts like a refrigerator here. Um, next, we have considered the situation that you have a marginal observer from the viewpoint of thermodynamics. So uh, what happens if we only observe X naught? So let's start from the full system. If we write down the entropy balance of that system, of course, we have um, two contributions to the medium entropy production, one on the um, cold side and one on the hot side. And then there could be the change, there's a change of Shannon entropy, which importantly is here the Shannon entropy of the joint system and um, in steady state this uh, nullifies. Now, if we had a marginal observer that can only see X naught, this marginal observer would only observe this heat flow and it would observe the marginal probability distribution from which it con could, uh, the, the observer could um, con calculate the marginal Shannon entropy. And uh, what we found is that um, these quantities um, are connected with each other in the form of a generalized second law that looks like this. So for this marginal system, we can also write down an entropy balance and it contains the medium entropy production, it contains the Shannon entropy, and additionally, it contains an information flow term. And only if we include this, uh, we uh, obtain an ent marginal entropy production, which is on average always greater than zero or zero in equilibrium. And this information flow term here um, is um, it's called the continuous information flow or it's also called the learning rate in the literature. And it is connected to the mutual information between the two beats. Uh, in a sense, it quantifies um, the change of the uh, mutual information due to the dynamics of X naught. And you can also uh, interpret it as the thermodynamic cost that X naught has to pay in order to sustain these, uh, the correlation with X1. And of course, these generalized second laws are quite well known in thermodynamics. I am sure you have all seen them. But here I want to stress that um, it's less, um, they are less established for time continuously operating systems. So in many scenarios like maxwell Demon kind of um, setups, you would always be in the situation that uh, you measure the system and then later you, uh, or immediate, uh, immediately you apply a feedback force, but then you wait some time and then you measure again. And this is often also true in experimental setups while here we time continuously operate on the system. So in each instance in time, you both have the measurement and the feedback operation. And um, we have also uh, 
in uh, the, the reference that I will give you at the end, we have also generalized this to more than two variables, um, which is, yeah, uh, a bit non-trivial because uh, the mutual information is only well-defined for two variables usually. Um, yeah, and from this generalized second law, we see that the heat dissipation of X naught can become negative if the information flow uh, is negative. So uh, the, there is um, netto information flowing from X naught to X1, which means X1 acts like a controller on X naught. And here you now see um, the full diagram of the heat flow of X naught and the information flow from uh, X1 to X naught in a map where you have the two uh, non uh, the off diagonal elements of the coupling matrix. Um, so, um, and the left side shows the heat flow. And if we first focus on this um, vertical line in the middle, where the model sort of resembles an active einstein uhlenbeck particle, we find that the heat flow is always positive and it can never be zero or negative. And that makes perfect sense. If we have an active particle, we would always expect it to heat up its environment. And we also have an information flow, which is because if you would monitor the particle alone, you could also reconstruct where the flagellum has been. On this horizontal line, we find uh, where, where the model, um, where X0 is like um, chemical concentration that is sensed by a cellular sensor, we of course find a zero heat flow because being sensed doesn't bring us out of equilibrium. However, there is uh, still an information flow because the sensor is learning about the system. And then in these intermediate areas, we can have um, both positive heat flow and we can have negative heat flow here. And um, this negative heat flow is always associated with this negative information flow. And um, what we found is that this uh, negative heat flow here is um, connected to a phenomenon known for systems subject to feedback, which is called feedback cooling or uh, entropy pumping. Um, before I come to the end, I briefly want to mention that we also considered the case of n variables. So um, if you not just have one non-reciprocally coupled variable, but more of them. And um, for the dynamics, we find something interesting. Um, so while if, when we just have one variable, we always found exponentially decaying um, memory kernels and exponentially decaying colored noise. We find if we have more than one variable, so for example, two, we can also have situations where the um, memory kernel is non-monotonic. So that means, for example, in this situation, uh, we have uh, a feedback force acting on the system, um, which depends on the past of X naught, but mostly at a certain characteristic time tau, and that is very um, common for systems subject to feedback loops, where the feedback loop takes some time. And as you can see, you can model them uh, with these um, aux with auxiliary variables that are non-reciprocally coupled, but they have to be non-reciprocally coupled. If you go to reciprocal coupling, you would always just have exponentially decaying memory in the system. And, um, yeah, at the end, I also want to mention as an outlook that we are now um, looking at applications of this or experimental realizations. So uh, we have a collaboration uh, with uh, Ali Rajapur, who is doing, uh, and uh, Said Arab, who is doing MD simulations. And uh, we're trying to realize this very simple, non reciprocally coupled setup here in MD simulations. And uh, we already find that, uh, and we treat the system like a nano refrigerator. So we consider how much energy we have to supply to um, sustain the non reciprocal coupling and how much heat we can extract from the cold side like a nano refrigerator. And uh, we see that there's already quite um, good results that we can match the, um, that the theory can match the, uh, um, the MD simulations 
And uh, it's quite cool because the MD simulations are actually below the larger dye regime. And uh, we have also started to discuss with um, Sergio Siliberto about possibilities to realize such a simple setup in electrical circuits and uh, to build a refrigerator on that scale. Yeah, so um, this I want to summarize. I hope I could show you a little bit that non-reciprocal interactions are inevitably uh, accompanied by heat and information flows in the system and that the information flow is an essential part uh, of the entropy production if you consider a marginal system. And uh, you can even find heat flow from cold to the hot side. And I also showed you these uh, pseudo equilibrium states where two different drives compensate each other, which I find quite interesting. And um, yeah, with this, I want to thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. Keep it on time also. Questions from the audience? I have one question. Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah, Where you uh, I, I don't know. I'm Noel. Uh, I don't know if I understand correctly, but you talk about uh, negative information flow and, and you say that is something like a pump. I don't know. I don't really understand that. But negative information flow can be understood like misinformation or something like that or am i yeah. totally wrong yeah uh thank you for that question i was not uh very uh i did not talk a lot about that so um yeah the information flow is the directional quantity sorry i'm trying to find the slide yeah so the information flow is always a directional quantity so it always has a sign and the sign shows us in which direction the information flow actually goes so, for example, in a steady state, um, in this two variable setup, you would have two information flows, one going from one to zero and one going from zero to one. And uh, the sum of them would always be uh, zero because the mutual information on average doesn't change in the steady state because the two point probability density is conserved. So you would actually always have one information flow being negative. So that just tells us in which the direction is flowing. And you can, um, the interpretation is that if you have a positive information flow, it means that um, the, uh, so if the information, if you have a positive information flow from X um, one to X naught, for example, it means that if you measure X one, you can say more about the future of X naught as compared to the present state of X naught. And uh, this can, of course, also be negative. So it could also just mean that you can say more about the present state, state of X0 by measuring X1 than you can say about the future of X0 by measuring X1. So no, um, a negative information flow doesn't mean misinformation. It just tells us who is the sender of the information, who is the recipient. Thank you. Ah, cool. Eh, eh, and just one other question not related. Eh, what is the force field that you use when you make molecular dynamic simulations? Uh, uh, what is the, the what? force field? Like the uh, MBA physics is like the equation that you derive when you so ah, make okay. a solution of the Newton's yeah, equation. So, so these are uh, Newtonian equations of motion and we use this Van Hove thermostats. I don't okay. know if that clarifies the question. I'm not yeah. Doing so. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You know, yeah. a question from the audience now. Huh? Uh, hi. Um, so many of your examples of these non-reciprocal systems were sort of like reciprocal systems where a degree of freedom was frozen out. So, like for instance, two walkers with one person facing the other way. Yeah. It's like saying that you can't use an angular degree of freedom. So does that mean that these results have some sort of implication for the short time dynamics of reciprocal systems where maybe there's a slower degree of free, like, you know, um, a persistence yeah. length in a, an angle or something? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so no, I think in general, um, the results are, um, uh, the, and, and the results, we don't assume the timescales. So the timescales could be similar or they could be very different. 
if the time scales are very different, um, you will lose the effects. So the effects emerge from the fact that you have similar time scales. Um, but uh, it's true in the example of the uh, pedestrian, it's maybe not the best example. Um, um, so yeah, normally you would like to have them operate on similar time scales in order to see these effects. Yeah. Any other questions? May I ask a question? I'm, I'm okay, online. Go ahead. Okay, so nice talk. Uh, so I was just wondering when you uh, introduce this uh, positive and negative information flows. So uh, is this some somehow connected to the concept of transfer entropies? Because when uh, when you include some suppressor variables uh, to predict the target variable, generally the entropy of the target variable decreases and your information or predictability increases. And otherwise, if it decreases, you will get a minus sign. So is there any connection? Um, yeah, so thank you for this question. Um, so yeah, the transfer entropy is also a concept to quantify information flows, which is more established even. Um, I think, unfortunately, you cannot see all the references, but um, so especially this reference here by uh, Jordan Horowitz is very nice because it compares these two measures are uh, next to each other. And uh, it depends on the um, setup, which information flow is more important. So in this case, um, it's a kind of information storage in a finite amount of degrees of freedom. And here the information, this continuous information flow will come into play. If you have um, an external memory that is, in, um, that is uh, infinitely large, you would, uh, instead look at the transfer entropy and that would be the measure that quantifies the thermodynamic cost of storing this information so it really depends on the um yeah on the setup that you look at and in this case it's a continuous information flow but yeah as i said i would recommend to look into this beautiful reference where you can find all these things listed together and um so it really depends what, what you are looking at and also what question you ask. Uh, if you want a kind of information measure that is connected with entry production or not. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Is there a question? Okay, final, final question, okay? Let me just stop for that. Yeah, Hi, Sarah. Could you go back to the slide of the memory kernel, non-monotonic memory kernel? Yes. So let me try. <laughs> yes. So um, if I understand correctly, when you look at the other networks, they are very non-reciprocal in the sense that one particle doesn't yes. see the, the, the other one, the left one. Yes. And, and then you see a non-monotonicity in the memory kernel. Yeah. So if this wasn't the case, like if it was less non-reciprocal, then you would also see the non-monotonicity. So yeah. my question is basically, is the non-monotonicity suggesting that you have non-reciprocal interactions? Yeah, so um, very good question. I just for simplicity show these extreme cases. It's true here we have just unidirectional coupling, which is the most non-reciprocal one. Um, if you add uh, the counterclockwise direction just weaker, then you will also get non uh, a non-monotonic memory kernel, but it will not be zero at time difference zero. So it will just look more like, yeah, like this. And uh, what, you, what we showed is that you need some sort of non-reciprocity to get something non-monotonic, but, um, really in order to get this zero offset, you need this unidirectional coupling. And um, yeah, in this scenario of feedback control, you typically want that. Because you, if you have a, a feedback loop with a finite time, um, so this is the finite time that let's say um, the measurement takes and then the feedback controller needs some time and then later it will apply a force and you don't want any offset at zero. So, um, but yeah, this is just a special special case. And of course, I should stress that this is all just true for overdamped equations. If you have um, the inertia, then you have all kinds of oscillations anyway, and then you are not uh, monotonically decreasing. 
anyway. And also what is interesting is that the colored noise is always monotonically decreasing in these setups. Okay, thank you. Let's, let's thank the speaker again. And then we'll come to the end of this part of the session. We'll come back at 11.15, okay? In 20 minutes from now, 22 minutes. Thank you. Yes. Shall I turn it off or?
So I think we should sl uh, slowly start the starting because it's uh, otherwise we accumulate, uh, we accumulate delay. For practical reasons, I would uh, um, suggest and actually encourage those who are asking questions at least uh, to first say his or her name. And this is true both here, but especially for those who are online because uh, we cannot uh, see you and sometimes it's a bit uh, difficult to. Okay, so first tell always your name. Then I give again the floor to Raul for chairing the session. Okay. Now, the next talk is by Urna Basu. Uh, can you, can you share? Urna, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Should I start sharing? Okay. Yeah, just start, start sharing. Okay, and you can start. Your talk is, is 25 plus five minutes. 25 minutes plus five questions. Yes, can you see? Yes, we can. Okay, okay. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me. It's great to be back at CISA uh, virtually. So I'm going to talk about active down motion with direction reversal, reversals. So this is based on joint works done with my colleague at uh, Ramanitas Institute, uh, colleague, uh, colleague uh, Shonji Chawapundit and his PhD student, Anand Shatra, who is also in the audience today. So here's a brief outline of, of this talk. I'll uh, introduce active particles very briefly uh, first, and then I'll go on to talk about this particular active motion that uh, is the main topic here today, direction reversing active down end motion. And then I'll discuss the various dynamical regimes shown by this uh, kind of motion. And then I'll discuss the position distribution in this uh, different, um, and in these different regimes. And then uh, if time permits, I'll very briefly mention what, uh, how it behaves in, a, in the uh, presence of a harmonic class, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so active matter. What is active matter? It's a collection of uh, self-propelled active agents, each of which can generate directed motion, consuming energy from environment at an individual level. So this makes this kind of motion inherently non-equilibrium in nature. And examples of active matter can be found in, in uh, at all length scales, both in nature and also there are many uh, artificial uh, engineered systems. So in nature, the typical examples that uh, example that we are all familiar with the motion of a bacteria. But on the other hand, hand of, the, of the scale, there are also bark flocks and tree schools where uh, a single fish is like an active agent. And then there are artificial systems like micro or nano swimmers or genus particles of uh, different kinds, which uh, show a similar kind of motion. Okay. So this is active. So Sorry, we're losing you. It's not good. To use? Hello? Urna? Hello? No. We, yes? We can lost the me? last 30 seconds. Can you hear me now? Now we can. Now we can. Okay, okay. Okay. Yeah, I was just going, I was just saying that uh, we'll use minimal statistical models to understand this individual uh, active particle dynamic. So there are various kinds of uh, models uh, for active particles, which them have some internal like location or internal states, which couple with the positional degree of freedom to uh, give rise to this directed motion, which is this active motion. So two of the most famous models are the so-called active Brownian particle and run and tumble particle. Okay, so active Brownian particle, their, their dynamics is, I mean, the characteristic uh, part of the dynamics is there is an internal orientation, which changes via uh, some rotational diffusion. So examples of uh, systems which follow this kind of motion are catalytic swimmers and, and various other kinds of genus particles. On the other hand, there are the run and tumble particles where the orientation changes via discrete jumps. So uh, again, the typical example is the, a bacterial motion like E. coli. Uh, however, the, the topic of today is a different kind of motion, which uh, is, is, is described by either of these two modes. So there's uh, something called direction reversing active motion. So here I have given some examples. So the first one here is the, the video of the motion of a certain kind of bacteria called Mycococcus xanthus, 
The second one is, one is another bacteria called Pseudomonas pupita. So the typical motion that I'm talking about is, is uh, best visible here. If you follow this blue trajectory, so the particle is moving uh, along a certain direction which itself is bending a little bit. So that's like an active Brownian motion. But then suddenly it reverses this direction. Okay, so it's like a direction reversing active Brownian motion. Okay, so there are, uh, the third one is from an experimental system. It's a light, uh, light tunable uh, particle. Uh, so there are also many other kinds of bacteria which follow a similar uh, motion. And uh, our purpose of, I mean, the purpose of this talk is to understand theoretically, uh, what are the typical features of this kind of uh, motion. So I'll introduce the model we are going to use first. So we are uh, interested in the motion of such uh, such uh, direction reversing uh, Brownian particle on, on 2D. So we talk about an overturned particle which moves with a constant speed V0 in 2D. Apart from the position XY, it also has its in, uh, internal orientation theta. So theta is, is the, uh, denotes the angle that the internal orientation here, this blue arrow schematically denotes this internal orientation. Uh, so the angle that it makes with the x-axis, so that's my theta. And then uh, this theta evolves in time, that's how we uh, get the active motion. But there are two different kinds of motion for the theta. One is that it, it rotates slowly via a diffusion process. And another is that this theta can uh, suddenly uh, go to theta plus two pi, which is like the reversal of the motion. So this uh, motion can be described by this set of uh, Langeva equations. X dot is V0 sigma t cos theta, Y dot is V0 sigma t sine theta. So theta is this uh, angle, as I said, it undergoes a rotational diffusion motion. So theta dot is proportional to eta, a white noise, and dr is the corresponding uh, diffusion constant. And then there's the sigma t, which is a dichotomous noise. So it can take values plus one and minus one, and it can flip its sign with some rate gamma. So there are two kinds of, uh, two origins of noise here. One is this uh, reversal of intermediate reversal of this of this sigma that gives rise to the reversal of the direction of motion. The other one is the slow diffusion of, uh, of this uh, theta. Okay. So throughout this talk, I'll assume that at time t equal to zero, the particle starts from the origin without any loss of generality uh, with, a, with a certain internal orientation theta naught and sigma equal to plus one. So uh, clearly this motion is different from both ABP and RTP, uh, but in between uh, consecutive reversal events, it behaves like an ABP. Okay. So this model has been used in numerical simulations to understand certain collective properties of mycococcus anthers, but there, are, uh, there is no analytical understanding beyond the position variance. So this is what we are going to discuss here. And our main um, ob observable that we will concentrate on is the position distribution of this uh, part. So uh, before going there, let's have a closer look at the dynamics of this direction, uh, direction reversing active Brownian motion. So, so we can recast this dynamics as uh, in terms of some effective noise, zeta x and zeta y. Okay, so I've, I've simply written uh, zeta x as v0 sigma t cos theta t, but then theta t is theta naught initial orientation plus phi t, which is nothing but a Brownian motion. And then uh, sigma t is the dichotomous noise, as I said. So here in this uh, plot, I, uh, I have shown a typical trajectory of, of this direction reversing active Brownian particle. So this green dot here, I'm not sure if you can see. So there's a green dot here, which indicates the initial position, and then it moves. And then uh, this blue and red arrows indicate the present sigma state. Okay. Uh, in the inset, there is a trajectory which is much longer, which has taken over a much longer duration of time. And uh, you can see that this looks more or less like ordinary diffusion, although at a smaller time scale, it's uh, something very different, very different than ordinary diffusion, as well as very different uh, than the ordinary ABT, ordinary active Brownian particle. Uh, so our, our objective here to, is to understand how this position distribution evolves uh, dynamically. Okay? So clearly there can be two scenarios. One is when gamma is, the reversal rate is larger than the diffusion constant or when it is smaller. So here uh, we show how the position distribution evolves in these two cases. So the first panel is where gamma is much smaller than dr. So here uh, we see, so I'll start it again. Yeah, here we see that the, as time evolves, so the, the, this, these are 5,000 particles, all of which start from theta naught equal to pi by four. And blue arrows indicate the current sigma equal to plus one and red arrows indicate current sigma minus one. And we see that for gamma smaller than dr, the position distribution evolves and uh, evolves into, a, in, into an isotropic uh, a circular uh, kind of distribution quite quickly. 
on the other hand for gamma greater than uh, dr it's actually uh, retains anisotropy for a very very long time okay. uh, so what i am going to discuss is that actually this uh, depending on the two time scale dr inverse and gamma inverse uh, there can be four different uh, dynamical regimes so one is the short time regime where time is much smaller than both the time scales both gamma inverse and dr inverse so there is a characteristic shape of the distribution position distribution in that regime and then depending on whether gamma is larger or smaller than dr there is an intermediate regime and then there is a long time regime uh, which which is when time is much larger than both the time scales and we'll discuss how the what is the characteristic shape of the position distribution in these four possible regimes so just to give you an idea about the uh, real system uh, so in in microfocal xanthus gamma inverse is about 100 seconds and dr inverse is about a million second whereas for pseudomonas putida the other uh, bacteria which was uh, bacterium which shows uh, this kind of uh, motion gamma inverse is 0.13 second and dr inverse is uh, 43 second so we see that there is a clear time scale separation between these two uh, these two uh, scales and the intermediate regime is actually quite important and we'll see that that's where the most uh, uh, non trivial result actually comes so before going to the details let me just briefly tell you uh, what what uh, what we are going to see so we'll see that at short time uh, short time regime so the when time is much smaller than both the time scales uh, the distribution is strongly anisotropic and, and non diffusive and at the intermediate regime when gamma is larger then again it's anisotropic and, and non diffusive with a non trivial scaling fun function which will uh, which will derive and in the in the two other regimes uh, it's actually diffusive and isotropic and and uh, shows a typical gaussian distribution so here are, are some plots obtained from numerical simulation so the first column is for at at short time so here you see that both for gamma are smaller and larger than dr the qualitative shape is like this it's like sort of a hammer uh, this is so this direction is the initial orientation on the other hand for uh, t much much larger than both the scales uh, the distribution is uh, single peak uh, with a peak at the origin it's very gaussian looking uh, now for the intermediate regime if gamma is larger than dr it's uh, some sort of an anisotropic shape you see the the heat map is is uh, the contours are like uh, ellipses and for gamma smaller than dr it's again uh, gaussian map so this this one this uh, second middle panel that is the most interesting regime but before going there i'll just discuss briefly all the other regimes that we get the first one is the short time regime when time is much smaller than both these scales okay so which means that drt is is very small which means that phi t which is proportional to square root drt is also small so mathematically we can approximate cos cosine phi as 1 and sin phi as uh, phi so that gives a simplified form to this effective noise uh, that we had so remember here is the exact form of uh, the effective noise given so in this regime they can be approximated by by this uh, equation and the mean square displacement one can calculate it exactly it turns out that the mean square displacement in this regime for both x and y are proportional to tq so it's very uh, very anisotropic and the coefficient of tq are are different for x and y which means that it's also uh, Uh, an isotropic and uh, yeah the cube means non diffusive okay so to calculate the distribution we uh, take recourse to a trajectory based approach i will not go into the details of the calculation but what we do is uh, to look at a trajectory with n number of reversal events and compute the uh, position distribution for that particular trajectory and then sum over all possible uh, such trajectories and sum over all possible uh, number of uh, jumps uh, yeah so Uh, because uh, phi t is just a brownian motion we can actually uh, calculate exactly what it uh, what it gives uh, and it uh, the position distribution can be expressed as an infinite series which is not very uh, useful as it is but uh, what happens is that for now if at short time regime remember we are looking at time uh, time scales shorter than both dr inverse and gamma inverse so uh, for small gamma one can actually perturbatively evaluate uh, this uh, this series uh, systematically and one can get the position distribution in this regime so here is a plot of of the marginal distribution of uh, along x which shows a very um, unique shape this kind of position distributions are not seen in either rtp or abp so here there is a plateau around the origin and then there is a gaussian peak around x equal to v not t 
and this is actually obtained from the symbols are are from uh, from numerical simulation and the black lines are from the analytical calculation here but keeping only uh, n equal to 1 and 2 terms so this plateau is actually a result of uh, uh, one reversal or two reversal events okay so uh, it's uh, direction reversals which give uh, rise to this kind of uh, of a plateau in the position distribution okay uh, next i'll go to the to the long time regime where time is much larger than both the time scale and from the trajectory plot we already sort of expect that here one should uh, see a gaussian like distribution and indeed that it that is what happens so uh, here one can show more rigorously that an effective noise actually emulates a white noise but with an effective diffusion constant it depends on dr and gamma both and um, uh, the the diffusive nature of of the motion in this region is clear from the fact that x square and y square average both go uh, uh, grow linearly with with time t with this effective diffusion constant and uh, the typical distribution is a gaussian with a, with a diffusive uh, scaling uh, here again in uh, we compare this prediction with numerical simulations which show excellent uh, match so just to give a quick reminder this behavior is similar to long time behavior of of ordinary active brownian particle but with a different uh, effective diffusion, uh, diffusion constant okay then we come to the intermediate regime which happens when dr is larger than gamma then again uh, one gets uh, a, a diffusive behavior but with a different uh, effective diffusion constant once again uh, the effective diffusion constant is d square divided by dr and the typical distribution is gaussian again okay so again uh, comparison with the numerics uh, yeah now we come to the most uh, interesting regime when gamma is large Uh, gamma is much larger compared to dr and we are looking at the intermediate region so t is much much larger than gamma inverse but much much smaller than dr inverse so t much much larger than gamma inverse means that uh, that the average number of reversal events which is gamma t much larger in this regime one can approximate this uh, dichotomous noise sigma t uh, by a white noise right it becomes delta correlated again one can show it uh, rigorously but i'm just making uh, a statement here but the uh, strength of this noise is uh, is given by gamma inverse on the other hand because t is much smaller than dr inverse so phi t is still uh, still small so this uh, cosine theta t and cosine uh, sine theta t we can still use uh, the same approximation we can keep it up to linear order in in phi and now this uh, these effective noises resemble that of uh, so the lanza equations with this effective noises resemble that of a 2d diffusive particle uh, because it's just white noise but the diffusivity itself is a stochastic function of time so this <coughs> this this term here cos theta not minus phi t sin theta not it's like a diffusivity but which is evolving with time okay. so one can again calculate the mean square displacement exactly and it turns out that the leading term is is uh, t uh, proportional to t so it's like a diffusive motion but uh, there is still an isotropy because along x and y uh, the the coefficients are different so uh, we want to understand the position distribution in this region so what one can do is that uh, adopt a path integral approach because again here what we have is just a white noise and a brownian motion so one can uh, actually perform all the path integrals exactly and one can arrive at the characteristic function of, of the 2d distribution So again, I mean, this is some exact expression um, where kx and ky are the corresponding Fourier variables for x and y. Uh, I mean, the, the expression doesn't mean anything, just except that it can be inverted for for any value of theta naught. But let us first uh, look at the marginal distributions. Okay. So from these exact expressions, we can find marginal characteristic functions. And the point to to notice here is that there is no no general scaling form. One cannot uh, write a general scaling form for pxt and pyt. and it depends uh, non trivially on the initial orientation theta not and it can be inverted numerically but to understand it better to understand this anisotropy better uh, what one can do is to look at uh, along the directions where the anisotropy is maximal in some sense so one can look at the position distribution along the initial orientation and orthogonal to the uh, initial orientation theta not okay so this is what we are going to do so first we look at the parallel component so if you remember the, the this uh, figure from some slides ago so this uh, black dash line here indicates the uh, direction parallel to the initial orientation and we can get the corresponding um, uh, 
that is the function by taking theta not equal to zero and ky equal to zero. And it turns out that the characteristic, characteristic function is that of a Gaussian. Actually, it's exponential minus k square times something, which gives rise to a diffuse scaling form for the position distribution. This is a diffuse scaling, scaling form, which means that along the initial orientation, the motion is actually diffusive. Okay. And it, it, it does not depend on dr, it depends on gamma only. And the scaling function is, is nothing but a Gaussian. So here you can see in this plot, uh, the, 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 the scale plot of uh, p x parallel at uh, some time t in this regime for different values of, of gamma and dr. And a perfect collapse uh, shows you that uh, it's actually like that. So the, the direction reversing active ground input of, uh, particle actually shows a diffusive motion along the initial in this intermediate time. On the other hand, if we look at the orthogonal component, there the characteristic function is something very different. It's uh, of the form one by square root of cosine, uh, cosine hyperbolic. And it's actually, it, it, hello, am I audible? Hello? We, we can hear you. Yes, 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 yes you Hello? Yes, you are audible. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so the, the resulting scaling form is actually a ballistic scaling form. So the position distribution at any setting for, for the orthogonal degree is a function of x perpendicular by v 0 t with some other constants, which depends on gamma and dr. Okay. And we can calculate the scaling function as well, which is given in terms of gamma function. So this scaling form actually is, is uh, is unique again to the direction reversing motion. We have not, we do not see it in, in, uh, in usual active Brownian motion, neither in, in, in RTP. And it shows the uh, exponential decay at the tails. Okay. So this is, uh, so this means that for, uh, for this direction reversing motion, we have a ballistic motion orthogonal to the initial orientation, whereas uh, for directions parallel to the direction parallel to the initial orientation, there's a diffusive motion. So this is uh, this uh, strange behavior is due to the presence of the reversal. So yeah, I'll quickly summarize. How much time do I have? Um, five minutes. Okay, okay, yeah. I'll, I'll quickly summarize uh, this part. So I have just discussed the, the nature of active Brownian motion with intermittent direction reverse, reversal. And we have shown that uh, because of the presence of two different time scales due to the rotational diffusion constant and uh, the reversal rate, there are actually four possible distinct dynamical regimes, each of which are characterized by different uh, shape of the position distribution. And at short time, the motion is strongly anisotropic and non-diffusive, and it has a weird shape with a plateau around the origin. At late time, it's typically diffusive. On the other hand, <coughs> in one of the intermediate regimes, when the reversal rate is, is, uh, is fast, uh, then we show we see a, a different kind of motion. There is a ballistic motion uh, along the orthogonal uh, direction. On the other hand, there is a diffusive motion along the parallel direction to the initial orientation. And we can also we have also found the non-trivial scaling function with the uh, exponential tail. Okay. So the next obvious question is what happens uh, if we have uh, this uh, kind of an uh, direction reversing active Brownian particle in an external potential? And we have actually studied it in the presence of, of the harmonic potential. So I will not go into the details. So this, uh, but uh, just just a brief teaser. Uh, what we see is that actually in the in the gamma dr and mu inverse, mu is the stiffness constant of the trap. There are uh, there emerges two new kind of passive and active phases compared to the uh, ordinary ABP or RTP uh, particle. So these two new phases are are. Uh, uh, they arise due to the presence of the reversal. And uh, this will actually be, uh, this is there in the, in the poster by Ayan Shantra. And uh, for details, you can, uh, you can check uh, his poster. So I'll just finish with uh, some open questions. First one is, uh, of course, I mean, if one can experimentally see this different dynamical regimes. And as it turns out, for both uh, Pseudomonas putita and Mysococcus xanthus, uh, the values of uh, gamma and dr are such that this intermediate regime should be accessible experimentally. And also possibly with this artificial active colloids where, uh, where time scales uh, might be tunable. And then uh, another question is of course, uh, what happens when these, are, uh, uh, if these particles interact with each other? What kind of collective behavior uh, 
uh, one can uh, expect. So these are the open questions with this uh, uh, with this uh, direction reversing axis Brownian particle. And uh, finish by thanking you for your attention. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Hmm. Now we start the questions. The new questions from the audience. Okay. Hi, hi, Urna. Yes, Andrea hi, hi, Gambas. Hi. Yes, yes, I am. So I have a, qu a question. So at a certain point, you show that uh, the, the the mean square displacement around one direction or the, the other grows like T cube, as it would be yes. Uh, super yes. ballistic. Yes, yes. And so I was a bit uh, surprised by that because I was expecting that somehow the ballistic uh, uh, growth would have been the like uh, like. Uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, do better than that. Uh, no, no. So this is actually, uh, this feature is not very new. So even for just ordinary active Brownian particle, if you look at the mean square displacement along uh, the initial orientation, that actually grows as t to the power 4. And for ordinary RTP, this is TQ. Okay, so here. Uh, okay, it's, okay, it's okay, no, okay. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I see. You're right. Any other questions from the audience? Anyone from Zoom? Yeah, I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, so uh, yes. I'm I'm on Bishash. So I have this very nice question. Um, uh, the assumption of Gaussianity in the noise processes. How does this correspond to a experimental observation about this uh, microbial uh, run and tumble motion? Which which uh, assumption of Gaussianity? Where? So you have you you have in the theta dot um, you have taken uh, I think uh, if I remember correctly white Gaussian noise. Yes. So how does yeah. this correspond this to the microbial environments who actually displays no, this so run and tumble for, motion? Uh, no, for run and tumble motion you don't have this Gaussianity. So for run and tumble motion what you have is that this theta changes by a discrete amount. So the particle goes on a straight line and then suddenly theta goes to some theta prime. It changes by a finite discrete amount. And, and, uh, and then, then uh, uh, so on and so on. So this is like tumbling. Here it's, it's more like an active Brownian particle where the, the orientation uh, changes slowly via, via some diffusive continuous process. So where is this energy source located in these particles? Like for the microbes, uh, it is within them, right? The ATP production, and they has yes, to continuously yes. exp expand this. Now, how do you how right. do you, uh, the, how do you place this non-animate and animate uh, objects together? Uh, no, okay. So for this, uh, so this ABP kind of motion are typically in some genus particles or uh, catalytic swimmers. So where you I, either shine light on them, so they're typically like uh, genus particles which have some. Uh, I mean, one surface of it coated with something. And then you either have a chemical reaction or you shine light on it, which gives this energy, and then they move in a certain direction. So it's, yeah, it's coming from much. some chemical. Yeah. Hello? No, we're going to hear you. Hello? Hello? Yes. Was there any okay. other question? I don't know. There was a comment in the chat about your movies. I don't know where you saw that. Oh, okay. So there, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you have shown in the first part of the particles. These are non-interacting particles. These are done with uh, completely non-interacting particles. Just each of them are, are spreading. Uh, with time, and we are just looking at the uh, at the position distribution of the. Can, can you please read the the question in the chat? Yes. So Cesare is asking. Uh, you have shown in the first part of the talk a movie of expanding cluster of particles colored accordingly to the value of sigma. Were these simulations done with interactions among particles? So the answer is no. These are completely non-interacting particles. Just a collection. To, to show the distribution at, at one go. So these are like ensembles of uh, independent particles. Okay, thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, we thank the speaker again. 
And then we move to the next talk, which is also an online talk by Giovanni, uh, Giovanni Volpi from the University of Gothenburg. Giovanni, are you there? Yes. Here okay. You can start sharing your screen. You have, again, 25 minutes. Yes. <clears throat> so can you hear me and see my screen well? Yeah, it's, it's okay. You can start now. Okay, perfect. So, yes, well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, the possibility of giving this talk. It's very nice uh, to be virtually there. It's a pity that, uh, obviously, we could not meet in person. Uh, what I will speak about, it's... Um, Mm, we will give a very brief overview of, uh, uh, of the convergence between uh, active matter and machine learning and um, especially explain how machine learning can be used for active matter. And uh, to motivate this, uh, we have to go back a few years and uh, all the uh, fuss about deep learning comes down to a challenge that was created a few years ago, well, many years ago, actually, and it's uh, this ImageNet challenge. The challenge consisted in uh, classifying these images so to identify essentially which objects are present in each image, like where there are dogs, where there are cats, and so on. And if you go back like 10 years, the best result was in the order, the smallest error that you could achieve with, um, let's say, classical machine learning algorithms was to around 25%, which means that one out of five, four, in a sense, more or less, means that one out of four images are misclassified. And uh, what is interesting is that after about 10 years ago, and in the following years, we see a huge decrease in the error in this challenge. So you see that we go down to around 5%, and then in 2016, down to 3.4% which means that almost all images get classified correctly. And this was thanks, as you can see here, there are blue, uh, these blue histograms. And this blue histogram corresponds to techniques that used deep learning, so deep neural networks, and deep convolutional neural networks to be specific. And you see that it goes down very, very fast. And what really triggered the, the deep learning revolution was the fact that in 2016, the machine managed to do better than humans. So humans will do more or less, in this classification task, will do like a 5% error. Machine did better than that like five years ago. And from there, uh, people got really convinced that uh, you could do analysis of images uh, automatically. And well, the, the gates open and uh, the machine learning revolution flooded uh, essentially every field of life. And at the end, it ended up, ended up also in active matter and soft matter physics. So in this talk, I will try to give a very compressed outlook about uh, machine learning in active matter. And to do that in an efficient way, I will uh, present one example that we did in my lab where we use machine learning successful to solve one problem and then give a brief overview of other case studies as well as uh, some ideas about opportunities and challenges of machine learning. So let's start, uh, well, defining active matter. I don't think it's really uh, very necessary for this audience, but let's keep in mind that active matter, which means matter subject to an influx of energy that drives it out of equilibrium, ranges uh, a huge numbers of orders of magnitude of uh, scales in time and space. So we can go from biomolecules up to large animals like, uh, I don't know, herds of elephants can be conceived as uh, active matter. So we have a huge range of scales and things get even more interesting when we consider this active matter in complex situations like in complex environments or in crowded situations where we have a lot of particles, active particles interacting with each other. And here we can think of a lot of examples drawn from robotics, biology, and other fields. So this is everything. Just to give you an idea, active matter is really covering uh, all ranges of uh, statistical physics on all scales. And <coughs> Now we move to machine learning. Uh, 
And again, I will give a very, very brief uh, overview. And machine learning, many people will uh, think immediately of neural networks, in particular, deep neural networks. And in fact, this is an important field of machine learning. So we have many kinds of neural networks. So convolutional neural networks, particularly useful for images, recurrent neural networks, useful for time signals, reservoir computing, and all of this is supervised learning. What does it mean supervised learning means that you have an in, you must have input data and output data, a set of data for which you know what inputs you want and what output you decide to obtain with that input. And then you train your network to do just that. Essentially, these are very complex, very highly dimensional fitting procedures, if you wish. But of course, uh, these are not the only supervised methods. We should not forget that decision trees and their uh, larger uh, version, the random forest, are very, very powerful tools that also have been very, very successful, but uh, nowadays are a bit forgotten compared with neural networks, especially in our fields. And yeah, one thing that it would be nice to notice is that this, as you see, is 2020. So it's roughly one year and a half ago, this uh, graph was made. Well, new things came up since then. So now we have a lot of new techniques like graph neural networks, uh, the concept of attention, transformers, and so on. So neural networks keep on uh, spurring new lines uh, and new architectures all the time. But in another category, we have semi-supervised learning, which sometimes is also called genetically reinforcement learning. And here we can think of uh, adversarial networks, uh, reinforcement learning proper, genetic algorithms, which are very forgotten in uh, most fields, but they're actually very powerful in my opinion. And um, the idea here is that you don't have a set of inputs and decide the outputs, but you have uh, an algorithm or a device that has to interact, uh, live in a certain environment and interacts with this environment. And then you select somehow, or you look, this uh, device learns how to behave in that environment in order to reach the highest fitness. It's semi-supervised because now we don't have an explicit output, but we just have an environment in which we can optimize the reward. And finally, we have all unsupervised methods, which go sometimes also under the name of classical machine learning, which uh, include, uh, uh, well, a lot of methods as uh, no one probably nowadays thinks too much of uh, as machine learning, like going from regressions, principal component analysis, k-means, self-organized maps. These are methods uh, that are often used to explore data. Okay, this gives you a very, very quick overview of machine learning as it was one year ago. As I said already, the field is evolving very fast, so new kinds of machine learning, especially new architectures of neural networks and more powerful architectures of neural networks are coming up on a monthly basis. So this is a work in progress in a sense. But in any case, so this is machine learning, and now we can see how we can apply this to active matter and soft matter physics in general, and therefore also statistical physics. I will give one example in some detail, and then some very quick examples drawn from work done in my lab. The example I want to give you is about the digital video microscopy, where the question is, well, uh, it's a very powerful tool in uh, statistical physics to work with Brownian particles, make experiments with Brownian particles, because you know Brownian particles jiggle around, move, so there is a component of stochasticity, but you can also apply very controllable forces on them. So you have a deterministic force field, the interplay between deterministic and stochastic elements uh, maps very nicely into stochastic differential equation or Fokker-Planck equations and so on. So there's a very deep connection to statistical physics. and well, when you do an experiment, uh, what you see is actually not the Fokker-Planck equation, but it's the video of the particles, which looks somehow like this, without the green rings, obviously. And uh, then you have to identify the particles, so to find the green rings. And what often is done nowadays in most labs around the world is this. So basically, you take the image acquired from the experiment and you threshold it. What does it mean threshold it? Transform it into a black and white image for a given threshold, looking like this one. And then you calculate the centroid of each white spot. 
And that's, uh, if you do that over time, then you can have trajectories for the particles and use them to analyze lots of their properties from their diffusion properties, anomalous diffusion, forces acting on the particles, biological activity of cells and so on. Well, I mean, it's really surprising how powerful is such a simple algorithm if you think about it, because this algorithm, this centroid destruction algorithm permits you to achieve sub pixel resolution. This means that we can actually map, uh, determine the position of a Brownian particle down to tens or hundreds, easily hundreds of nanometers, like with a bit of effort down to 50, 20 nanometers, which is pretty impressive considering that that's a fraction of the diffraction limit. Anyway, this is in an, in an ideal world where you have perfect images. If you go to real life, often you have images that are much more difficult to track. This is an example from experiments done in my lab. In this experiment specifically, we wanted to study how bacteria, these bright spots, which are motile, move in a background of passive particles, these round gray things that you see all around. And our idea was to study how these bacteria can open channels that then are metastable and to study the statistical physics of this process, which is pretty interesting. The problem, obviously, is that before we can study the statistical physics of this, we need to actually track the bacteria and the particles. And you see here that we have all, well, we have a good range of problems that can arise in digital video microscopy. We have blinking of the bacteria. We have non-uniform illumination because we want a very large area and a very noisy environment because we want to keep the illumination low, not to bother and photo bleach the bacteria. The experiment needs to run for hours, so we don't we need to keep the illumination low. Well, now the problem here is that your brain can track these things pretty well, but think of an algorithm and what the algorithm sees is a very zoomed in version of this. And the question is, uh, well, where are, is this a particle or a hole between particles? It's not that obvious if you are an algorithm and if you see a single frame, right? This one, for example. So it was very difficult. We tried with the best algorithm and the best students. And after weeks of effort, we got this, which is bad. This doesn't permit us to do any analysis of the video of the results. And the worst part is that uh, we optimized this patch and with the same parameters of the algorithm, standard thresholding algorithm, uh, we could not analyze the rest of this video, the other patches, it didn't work let alone other videos. So it was really weeks of work for very little, uh, yeah, lit very little to show for weeks of work. At that point is where we entered uh, machine learning. So we thought since machine learning is so good with images, maybe it can even track the particles here. So that's what we tried. And here I explain you very, very quickly how it works conceptually. It's a simplified version of the neural networks we employed. So here, imagine that you have this input image, you want to find the center of this particle. Well, what you can do is to convolve it with different filters, you get a feature map. And then you can do this with many different filters. Don't worry about the numbers in the filters, they are random for what we care at the moment. Then you have a convolutional layer. So where you convolve the input with many filters. You downsample it, mainly to reduce the number of pixels you have to deal with. And then you can have a dense layer where you combine these values into a neuron, just summing them up with some scaling factor, these omegas. Again, they can be random. And finally, you get the position. Again, combining the outputs of these neurons with some uh, weighted by some other values. And of course, since everything is random in this network, what you get is a random number at the output, so you don't get the position. Now, what you have to do in order to get the position is to backpropagate the error. That's a very powerful backpropagation, uh, error backpropagation algorithm, which tells you that if in a neural network, what you do is this, you measure the error, and then you change these weights one by one in order to decrease the error for a given sample. And you do this many, many times with many, many different samples. We are speaking of millions of samples here, hundreds of thousands, millions. And eventually you end up with a network that can give you the center of the particle in a very reliable way. 
Now, obviously you see the problem here. The problem is that to do this, since this is supervised learning, we need to have inputs and outputs. So we need to know in advance where is the position of the particle. And if we knew that, we don't really need the neural network. Well, what we did then was to use, well, first of all, we use a more complex neural network with more convolutional layers, more dense layers, but conceptually it's very similar to what I showed you before. Now, to train, what we did is to use simulated images. The advantage of simulated images is that, first of all, we can have as many as we want. Secondly, we know exactly the position of the center because we simulate them, so we can use the back propagation. And finally, it's very cheap to do so, which will be very, very expensive experimentally. So we did that. This works very well. Next question is, does it work on experimental data? Well, then we have to go to experimental data. So here we have an optically trapped particle. Optically trapped means that the particle is in an optical trap, which is a laser, a focused laser beam, which keeps the trap in a position. And we measure its position with the standard algorithm and with deep track. And the two agree perfectly, not surprisingly, because this is a very good image for an optically trapped particle. And also its probability distributions agree very well. And also its autocorrelation function agree perfectly. And also with theory, this fit with the dashed lines. Okay, so we know that our network trained on simulated images works perfectly for experimental images for which also standard algorithms work perfectly. Good, but not good enough. So what we did next is to keep the same particle in the same optical trap, switch off the LED, very good LED illumination, and switch on a uh, incandescence lamp next to it. So the image of the particle gets very bad. The standard algorithm cannot track it, but deep track can still track it perfectly. Since, and, and here you see the tracking done by deep track and by the standard algorithm, you see the difference. And here you see that uh, while the standard algorithm fails in getting the probability distribution of the correlation function, deep track can retrieve it basically perfectly. So this made us very confident about this algorithm and we went back to our original problem and uh, we could now track all the particles as you see very nicely. Actually, we can now track the particles for all the video in all, and also for other videos with the same trained neural network. Even better, we can also track and distinguish the bacteria, as you can see here with the round circles, which track the bacteria. And, uh, okay, let me skip uh, this. Uh, I, I can tell you. So here, this is a comparison with the other methods. Um, and you see that deep track is better than all these other methods that uh, in a standardized task. But I don't really want to go into the details. If you're interested in deep track, have a look at that because the software is completely free. We also have a second version of deep track that can be used in a much broader range of application and also microscopy applications. And again, it's all the software is completely free and very user friendly. So all of this is available online on our web page. What I want to show you now very briefly is some other applications of deep learning. One other application is to quantify anomalous diffusion. So here, you can uh, think, well, you can have different trajectories, which can be, have a different anomalous diffusion. And the anomalous diffusion is obviously characterized by the exponent of the mean square displacement. And you can have subdiffusion, normal diffusion, and super diffusion. The question is, how can I recognize the exponent uh, the of anomalous diffusion given just the trajectory? How well can I do that? Well, and the answer is that uh, that's difficult, but it can be done very efficiently with the recurrent neural networks, which is another flavor of neural networks. So you see that the neural network and mean square displacement give very similar results, both on simulated data and on experimental data, all these uh, bright spots, which is nice. But of course, it's never enough to be able to reproduce things that you can do with standard techniques. It's nice. It's useful to use uh, neural networks when you can do something beyond what you can do with standard techniques. So in this case, what we did is to show that we can go to more challenging situation. For example, we can take a trajectory sampled at uh, not uh, equal times, and still the neural network is able to reconstruct the value of the alpha very, very accurately. Or a neural network is able to detect the switching time and the 
anomalous diffusion exponent in a trajectory that uh, switches between two different anomalous BU diffusion behaviors. So in this case, you can see that the trajectory, we can identify both the anomalous exponent and the switching times. By the way, this anomalous diffusion tracking it's a very interesting topic. In fact, it's a very interesting topic. In fact, with several colleagues that you see mentioned here, we organized a challenge last year, which ended uh, last, uh, uh, I don't remember actually, last year in November, I think. And uh, in this challenge, the idea was to detect the anomalous diffusion, recognize the underlying model, and uh, so on. You can find the results of the challenge in the challenge website. And more importantly, there will be a second challenge that we are organizing right now and should open probably in a few months. So if any of you is interested in participating in the anomalous diffusion challenge too, keep tuned on this or drop me an email and it will be very nice if you want to participate. So. Okay, another example of something we can do with neural networks that is not so easy to do without neural networks is this one, where imagine that you have a Brownian particle trapped in an harmonic potential that switches between two different stiffnesses, very strong stiffness and very weak stiffness, like here. So you see the stiffness, weak stiffness, strong stiffness, weak stiffness, strong stiffness, and so on with a period. We don't know the stiffnesses and the period a priori, but we can assess, we have access to one trajectory like this one. Well, this one is a trajectory with relatively big differences in stiffnesses. And of course, it's also color coded. So it's very easy for you to visually see the difference. But when the difference becomes smaller, it's not so easy to visually see the difference between the two cases. And the question is, can you characterize the three values of the stiffnesses and the switching time? And you can do this in a very systematic way using, again, recurrent neural networks. So here you see that we can predict over a very large range of values, the stiffness, I and low, well, low and I, and the switching time in a very, very accurate way and over a very broad range. Now, this is not interesting only for a potential that switches between two different values of diffusion of um, stiffness, this is interesting for any dynamical model. As long as you have a model that you can parameterize, you can use the same technique to find out what are the best parameters for your model, given a trajectory of such model. Okay, let me skip this. This is more interesting. And this is a very recent work in which we try to apply some of these uh, ideas uh, to the obvious topic of testing and containment in epidemic outbreaks. And um, here we have a simple example of the SIR model in free evolution. So this is a sm small variation on the SR SIR model where we see how the disease spreads over time very reliably. So you see that the number of cases increases and then goes down as most of the population gets infected and recovered. Now, one way to prevent disease spreading is obvious with contact tracing, tracing and confinement, uh, lockdown, as you, or uh, well, confinement of uh, uh, the active cases. And you can see this here. So the blue ones are confined and you see that contact tracing works well at the beginning, but then you will end up having some breakout infections which will spread further the disease. So contact tracing alone doesn't work so well. What you can do instead is to employ a neural network to tell you which individuals to quarantine. If you do that, you can get, uh, with the same amount of individuals quarantined, you can get to actually completely stop the disease outbreak. So you see, this is a nice application of uh, neural networks to a problem of uh, obvious uh, current interest. The advantage of using neural networks is that you can decide which individuals to quarantine without having to have any explicit knowledge of the parameters of your underlying infection outbreak. So you don't need to characterize the neural networks finds out somehow the parameters of the outbreak and decides what to do accordingly without you having to input this explicit knowledge in any way. Well, you input it through the training data, but not explicitly. Okay, so this is just a very quick list of examples of obviously very 
limited in time, so I didn't go into the details, but if you're interested, you are very welcome to obviously read the paper or contact me. Now I want to just, uh, in the, I guess I have a few minutes, like two, three minutes, and um, uh, just, let's, say, let's say two. That's fine. I will just give a, a snapshot on, uh, well, what are the opportunities and challenges of machine learning? So opportunities, this is pretty obvious. Obviously there are plenty of opportunities in data acquisition and analysis, feedback control, but uh, very interesting topics that can be investigated and I didn't mention them too much because it's really ongoing research is the systematization of active matter or to gain insight into evolution and the biological active matter or to control swarm of uh, uh, robots and also active uh, biological systems through some elements that can control them. And finally, what is the uh, sacred grail, if you wish, is to find out a way to embed intelligence into microscopic active matter for real, not by controlling from outside with a computer. And uh, so what are the challenges that are still open? Well, of course, uh, we need benchmarks. So how do we benchmark uh, active uh, machine learning uh, models uh, against simple approaches? How, so, I mean, here's to give some guidelines. So first of all, you, we need to benchmark always. We need to prefer simpler models and we need to analyze and select the input features, which sounds obvious to a physics audience, but it's really against the idea of feature engineering is like going back to feature engineering in the 90s from the point of view of people in machine learning. And finally, it's very critical that the machine learning trained models are not employed outside the range of training. You know, employing a machine learning model outside the range of training is like extrapolating instead of interpolating. And I guess all of you know that extrapolation is a much trickier business than interpolation. And so what are the open challenges, in my opinion? So first of all, how do we know that a machine learning model is correct and robust? How do we understand the mechanics of the, uh, how do we get insight into the black box that machine learning of models often are? How do we use machine learning models informed by physics? So where we impose some constraints that come from physics, like think of a simple one, energy conservation. And, how can we benchmark alternative machine learning models against each other? How do we decide which one is the best? These are open questions so that I think are, uh, well, they, no, I don't think it's, uh, it's really there on top of the mind of people working in this area right now. And finally, last slide, the, there are actually lots of uh, benefits that the field of active matter and more extends in extends uh, and all statistical physics can actually bring it to machine learning. And in my opinion, these advantages go down to the fact that active matter experimental statistical physics has access to very large databases of data that are very, very controllable. So we can control a very large system of colloidal particles on the microscopic level. We understand the microscopic interactions. So we can make this connection between microscopic and macroscopic behavior of a system. And we can do this over long times, large systems and many time scales and length scales, which is not possible for a lot of other system in machine learning. It's obviously not possible to have full access to the macroscopic dynamics of a population of social individuals interacting on Facebook. We don't really have that access, but we do have access to the, and we can play and tune the dynamics of microscopic particles and see how this affects the behavior of a macroscopic behavior of a system, which is a huge opportunity for understanding which ones are the best and more uh, finely tuned uh, machine learning algorithms and devices that can be employed also in other fields. And with that, I would like to conclude. So I tried to give a very, very quick overview. And after briefly introduce active matter and machine learning, I tried to convince you that there are some problems that can be uh, successfully solved with machine learning in active matter, and therefore also in all generic statistical physics. I gave some very brief examples. And finally, I try to give an overview of what are the current opportunities and challenges. And also highlighting the fact that also machine learning can benefit from work done by statistical physics and 
and uh, active matter. So it's not a one way road. And of course, if you're interested in knowing more about this, we had this review paper last year where most of these ideas are contained. Again, it's a very fast evolving field. So some ideas are not there, but most of them are. And with that, I would like to thank you and leave you with this slide with the last in-person group picture of my group and the list of our funding sources. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni. Now the time for questions. There is one here in the audience. I have a question. Ah, okay. Wait, there is one for the... Okay, uh, my name is Jaron, and uh, I was just wanted to ask, there's a technique I'm familiar with that was developed um, while I was at Cornell, um, PERI or parameter extraction from reconstructed images for getting uh, centroid or, you know, the, the, the positions and radii of particles in um, disordered yeah. microscope images. Is this one of the techniques you compared with? Because my impression was they approach the ultimate bound the Kramer Rao bound. For so you're speaking of the radials. Um, yes, that's actually the technique that is shown, actually. Okay. And I agree with you. That's one of the best uh, approaches, very much. Uh, uh, the problem, I can tell you where that techniques break down and why we also chose to use a flore uh, incandescent lamp. It, it doesn't work well when you have a gradient of light, obviously, because then the centroid of the particle gets a bit shifted. Well, I think Perry models the the light fields. It is okay. <laughs> okay, so it's a different technique. So I don't really know the technique you mentioned. It could be what we used was radial symmetry technique, and I don't really know if it came from Cornell, but uh, uh, yeah. So that's what we used. It's a very standard technique, a very successful one, which was proposed um, like ten years ago, or no less actually, eight years ago. We don't model the light field. Okay, there is another question here in the live audience. Hello, I'm uh, Eric Aurel from Stockholm. It was a very, very nice talk oh, nice. from Sweden. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask a very general question because you had also some very general conclusions in your slides. How would you rate using machine learning to improve the analysis of the understanding of the data you already know how to acquire to developing better methods that give more accurate images or data which can be understood without machine learning tools thank you okay well that's a nice question well nice to meet you virtually eric <laughs> uh... I mean, obviously, if you can acquire better data that require less manipulation in order to be analyzed, that's obviously always preferable. Uh, so, but there are many cases in which you have constraints on the acquisition that are really out of your control. So the data quality is fixed. So you cannot really choose that. Then the other thing is that the one thing that often happens is that you might find, which happened to us in some projects, which I didn't present, we, you might find with machine learning a bet, uh, that you can analyze your data, extract more information. And after you have done that, you manage or some other people in your group can manage then to find a more classical way of extracting the same information. In that sense, somehow machine learning, it's a kind of front runner that uh, finds out that there is some information and motivates, I guess, uh, people to find a better way to extract this information in a more classical way. So in that sense, uh, of course, this is very welcome when it's possible because uh, it's always better to have an explicit method that uh, it's understandable instead of a machine learning method that is a black box. So I hope okay, it answers the question. Okay, thank you. Okay, we need to move on to the next speaker. Thank you again, Giovanni. Yep. Hi. Then the next speaker is Daniel Shadrach, Shadrach from Tanzania. Are you there, Daniel? Yes, I'm there. Okay, you're gonna start sharing your screen. Okay, good. 
Thanks. So you can see my screen. Well, 25 minutes. Thanks a lot. Uh, welcome, and I thank the organizers for this wonderful uh, conference and also for the invitation. And my talk uh, is going to be on uh, uh, soft matter biophysics. And in particular, I'm going to make an emphasis on uh, uh, computer aided drug design. Uh, We we'll lost you. Hello, Daniel. We cannot hear you. Longer time uh, once the drug has been. Uh, oh, sorry, Daniel. Uh, the connection went, went yes. down. <clears throat> Can you start again? We did not hear oh. what you said. Okay, so I begin from the. For the very beginning. Slide. Ah, thanks a lot. Uh, my talk is going to be on soft matter biophysics and with the emphasis on uh, how uh, tools like molecular dynamics or computer -aided drug design have accelerated the process of drug design. Uh, traditionally, uh, drug discovery design development is a little challenging and it takes about 15 years for a drug to be approved. But thanks now to the advancement of many techniques, including the computation tools uh, and advances in physics, which has helped a lot to understand uh, and manipulate the materials at atomistic scale. And uh, nowadays we can complement uh, what have been uh, not done for many years. So the process now of drug discovery for the modern approach will have like this kind of pipeline where both in silico approaches using molecular modeling can be incorporated to the practical or to experimental approaches. Before it was not uh, uh, easier to do. So we can predict most of the uh, problems like the solubility, the toxicity, the administration of the drug and how it could be excreted, which are the major reasons for many drug failure in the market. So with molecular dynamics, actually we are doing, uh, going back to, to our friends. Uh, Daniel, can, can you put the, your presentation? Daniel, yes. can you put yes. your presentation in full mode? Yes, so. it is in full mode. Okay, with the, are you switching slide, slides? Are you still, okay, now, now you are. Yes, so I'm no, no, repeating okay. it for the mood. Well, we're seeing the, the summary of the slides also. Um, no, but I, I just put it in this full mood. Do you see full mood? No. No, really, we're, seeing, we're, not, we're not seeing in presentation mode. You don't see in presentation mode? No. Again. But we do see the slides. You do the slides. Okay, so now this is, is... Here it is in presentation mode. Okay. Okay, okay go ahead. When we can... Okay, thanks. So actually here now we are integrating the Newton's equation of motion where we have the force that is equal to the negative gradient. And then we need to get the potential, which define the system as the combination of the bond, the bond, the angle, the torsion, and the, the non-bonded interaction. So by so doing, we use molecular dynamics as a tool that can help to understand how the drug could be binding and also unbinding from the receptor. And it can help us to understand, for example, this small molecule here, is unbinding from the protein. And then how long will it stay and uh, what is the binding and unbinding? Dynamics have helped the lot in understanding this and also accelerating and understanding more experimental uh, data. I will uh, just share with you some of the uh, work that we have done in the group here. So we know we first have, we characterized the interaction or of a smaller molecule 
uh, that is called the Rina Marine, which is uh, this one here. And interacting with- I don't think we see the same. Which slide are you in now? Which uh, slide number? Uh, I think it's the fourth one. No, we see the three. Yes, this you... first. Maybe it is going slower than, uh, it is going, I think, slower. Don't do presentation. Okay, don't don't do presentation mode. I'm told. Okay, I should not do presentation. So it go like this. Yeah. Okay. Is is okay with you this? Now we see. Now we see number four. Ah yes, I'm in number four. Yes. Thanks. So then we wanted to characterize the interaction of Rina Marine and the Rina Maras enzyme complex. Uh, Rina Marine is. Uh, uh, a small molecule that is found in cassava, and recently have raised more interest as an anti cancer compound. But it is interaction, and uh, with uh, this enzyme, remain not well understood at that molecular level. So, and because the protein is not uh, available in uh, the protein data bank, so what we did is to do homology modeling. And we use these different uh, uh, model tools like Swiss Modera and iTensor and Modera to model the protein. And then we compared with the source of the protein. After we have performed the molecular modeling, then we checked the stability. And then we performed three molecular dynamic simulation of the apoprotein. Uh, the protein that was a complex one. And again, after doing molecular dynamics, we extracted some ensembles, and then we did some docking calibration of the receptor, that is the enzyme, with the ligand in a marine. And the best uh, snapshot that we subjected again to do molecular dynamics, that is complex in number two. And therefore, our uh, molecular dynamics simulation is comprised of three uh, molecular systems uh, that we, 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 we performed. And we found that uh, this is the APO, the homology model protein without the, the ligand inside. And this is for complex number one for the red, and for the blue, it is complex number two. So we see that the molecular dynamic structure was more relatively stable when we compare to the apple and to the whole uh, ensemble structure in all the systems that we, 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 we did. And then it shows more stability compared to the molecular one. And then we were interested in comparing the interaction and the contribution of the less juice from the protein and how is it interacting with the enzyme there in a marine. And we see that there is a difference of residue from the ap uh, apoprotein from complex one and complex two. A complex two, I mean uh, the protein from the molecular dynamics simulation. Then we can see here, for example, this residue glutamine for one three is a, mm, having a passive contribution to the interaction, while in the other system is uh, positively contributing and interacting with the ligand, but here does not re interact. This we saw that to the flexibility of the, of the amino acid and the residues in the protein, which could result to unfavorable interaction. However, we then concluded that uh, there is a strong interaction of renamarine and it it is an uh, enzyme. Now I would highlight how molecular dynamics have helped us to understand the interaction of the small molecule. We have a lot of natural products that have been locally used in management and the treatment of diseases. Uh, here I will share a few of them. Uh, we have this compound here in uh, at the bottom here, the left bottom, uh, extracted from this plant with Tania somnifera. So we tested them computationally and in silico uh, as bacteria uh, or antibiotic compound because they have been used for a longer time here in the, the local community to manage many uh, bacterial infections. 
somewhere of this compound, they showed some promising activity in silico. And then we said to comprehend and give some understanding on how they are interacting with uh, the protein. So we choose one of the best compound that we performed the docking. And then we decided to do molecular dynamic simulation to relate the, to ascertain the observed stability and what we saw in the experiment. The less juice that, that highly contributed from the protein we found is ELA976 is highly interacting with uh, the with Thantide, one of the, 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 the ligand that uh, was binding most stable. And you see from the distance uh, that I can see that it is really uh, strongly interacting with the different residues as also suggested by the free energy decomposition of the each residues uh, contributing to the binding free energy. So this is uh, helping us to pro to give an atomistic insight on how the ligands or the molecule, the drug they are working. We then isolated some of this molecule in silk uh, from the plant, and then we characterized with GCMS tools. And then we wanted to understand now because uh, these were available in different quantity which of these is highly active against the various uh, bacteria. So we found that uh, this molecule here, disoterine tharet, was more active that compared uh, to the other molecules that we obtained from the extract. And uh, the results that we obtained from the molecular dynamic simulation uh, leaves in a good agreement with what we observed from the experiment where this molecule was uh, showing a good uh, inhibition and a stronger interaction compared to the other. We have been applying now computational methods to screen and uh, try to identify other smaller molecules for the treatment uh, of for the management of COVID. We have a lot of natural products that <laughs> were previously isolated in uh, the lab of one of my collaborators. And what we did now is uh, do similarity search. So first we started with our database with many compounds. So the compound the four one here from our database that we screened against the main protease of the virus. And the best ligand, that was ligand number 15 here, that showed the more stable interaction. We subjected to do an ensemble screening to database of FDA approved drug. And then we found three drugs that are in clinical application. And then we took these drugs, which are approved to do some stability, and investigating how they could be binding in the binding mode. And we found that one of this drug actually, this one here, which is an approved drug, and this one we are more stable. And uh, of course, uh, uh, some of them have been uh, uh, chanced into some clinical uh, trials for the COVID uh, management. We then wanted to investigate how this small molecule could block the virus entry to human cell. The virus enters the human cell by attaching to the angiotensin converting enzyme two, which is AC2, by strongly attaching using this residue like histidine type two and angiotensin 393. And so this is the, uh, the receptor binding domain of the virus. So ideally blocking this interaction here is ideal by preventing the virus not to enter into human cell. So again, we did some uh, molecular dynamics simulation of uh, this molecule here, and we found that uh, molecule number eight here was mostly working better than uh, the other. Then to, to, to get insight into the law of water, because water has known for quite longer 
that it mediates the biological process. It mediates also the interaction of the drug and also the maintaining the shape of the protein. So then we can see here at the interface between the viral protein, the viral protein and the human protein, the assay two, our molecules binding in between, but the stability of this molecule is uh, enhanced also by the presence of the water molecule that is surrounding the small molecule and also that they do the stabilization. And here we try to look the number of water that are available near each residue. As an example, we can see that the residues that are interacting with this small molecule here, they possess different amount of water. And also this could be influenced by the nature of the amino acids as the less used. So the more hydrophobic and the more hydrophilic residue would have different number of water. And also they are interacting in a different way. Although the larger distribution function shows that the interaction of water are within the same distance, but the intensity of the peak would signify the difference, I mean, the, the intensity and the amount of water that are available. And then we were interested to understand the dynamic of this uh, ligand, let's you. And then we uh, did metadynamics and enhanced the sampling method uh, that really accelerated and has an advantage over the class molecular dynamics simulation. Uh, a binding process that when the drug is in it is bound to form and when it is unbound we stop the calculation so we do this several times and uh, then we can calculate the free energy then we can see that the friend for the bound and for the bound system here is the move uh, that uh, because of the internet problem i don't know let me try again if it will do the striding i don't know if you can see it here uh, that uh, our molecule is at the, uh, the, at the interface of the two protein, the acid two protein, the human body, and the receptor binding protein, and this trying to disrupt the interaction here. And then we monitored the, the, the movement of this uh, ligand as the function hour of time. And then we tracked from one residue that it was forming the hydrogen bonding uh, that stabilizes also the interaction between uh, the residue and uh, the ligand that is carried in green here. Then we can say over time is really uh, moving. So this figure number C here is trying now to show the bound and unbound state of uh, this molecule in uh, uh, I or put it here, remove the, 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 the mode. Thanks. Now, the NIM tree also have shown some great promise in it, uh, managing the COVID by preventing the viral cell entry. We have performed some several series of experiments here, and we found that this molecules here isolated from them three in this by stabbing the recognition of the viral receptor binding to the human acid two and thereby preventing the entrance to the viral uh, to the human cell so to achieve that we performed uh, uh, different uh, uh, enhanced sampling methods calculation and also classical molecular dynamic simulation. Then we can see, for example, in figure 1A here, that the interaction of the protein uh, and the binding pathway is uh, somehow different. So we have differ used different corrective variable. Uh, the CV1 here is the distance between the protein and uh, CV2 is uh, the unbinding distance. So we can see that the molecule would spend a lot of time, so there's a larger free energy, 
in the bound state rather than in the an unbound state. And again, we tried to understand which less you are highly contributing to the interaction between this uh, amino acid and the ligand. So we found that less use like phenyl-124 and this uh, less use here, tryptophan-141, are highly contributing to this uh, interaction and the two destabilization of the ligand. The process of drug design also is really influenced by the flexibility of the protein. So accommodating protein flexibility in drug design is very important. We have found that if we do, we accommodate the least use of We, we lost you again. Uh, accommodating computational aspect, considering the flexibility of the protein is very essential. As an example, we can see here uh, the binding of the two compounds, the compound one and the compound three, which is compound one and compound three here, is, it, is, is different over different structures. Consistently, this compound number one length the risk compared to compound number two. But when we performed using the crystal structure, compound number one was the best than the compound number three. So this there is some information that some compounds in drug design act as false positive binders. So and therefore in order to eliminate the false positive binders, we need to accommodate and to involve the flexibility of the protein. And this has helped a lot. Now I want to share probably the two or last thing about the molecular simulation uh, on the uh, discovery on uh, uh, the heat shock protein inhibitors. And we, we are trying to understand the role of water again and the conformation of flexibility. And uh, we were happy to some extent that our simulation was able to meet some experimental data which was done by another group that was constantly reported. So we can see, for example, here at the middle HSP hole P, the pitavastatin is the most showing lowest binding free energy. Pitavastatin was shown a very small effective concentration against the various cell lines that we are tested for cancer cell. So this was an, a great a, a agreement to some big extent that uh, what we were doing also was uh, in a closer agreement to the experimental perspectives. Now experimental data have shown a, a good uh, promise that uh, now, now I'm moving to nanotechnology. Uh, that uh, the use of nanoparticle can enhance the drug delivery process of a drug and they can improve the half-life of poor resorbable drugs. Now, now computational work have been employed to understand how can the nanoparticle drug interaction be affected by the solvent and also the change in the pH as well as the release pattern. We previously synthesized the nanoparticle that for amidoamine dendrima and tried to do the encapsulation of a very poorly soluble drug like this, a flavonone molecule. And then we found that the dendrima that we synthesized was able to highly encapsulate and release the molecule. And the release was of course a pH dependent manner and then to gain more insight into this, we isolated many of these natural product and uh, in our group. And then we have tested to encourage them from using many uh, nanoparticles, including the chitosan nanoparticle. But one of the challenges that we observed, these molecules, they have shown some chemical instability uh, in, during the formulation process. 
and how do we mitigate and trying to understand we therefore used some uh, Thomistic simulation, molecular dynamics, to understand the interaction and the release pattern. Where the experiment, we were not to get some insight. And then we found that, for example, when the system of the same molecule, this one to something, is formulated in DMS and in water, the DMSO would really uh, accelerate the release to be very fast compared to water. This is actually is similar to what in the experimental uh, was was observed that water formulated the system would sustain the release of this molecule, but the behavior of the nanoparticle and uh, the the size it differs in different solvents. So in 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 the DMSO, the size is really larger as compared to water, and therefore we concluded from this uh, work that uh, DMSO would not be a good uh, solvent for the formulation of uh, this chemical and stable molecule into a, a, a ketosano nanoparticle uh, interaction. Then we have been focusing on trying to understand the conformation and the stability of this natural product uh, in a different solvent. And this has been done also by the student in, in the group. So I will just highlight one example of the Rina Marina. I mentioned you have, you have two minutes, Daniel. Okay, have two thank minutes. You. Thanks. So I will conclude with this uh, talk about uh, the self assembly process and the solubility of nicrosamide. This uh, drug is purely soluble in uh, water and uh, the solubility process of this has been a problem. So we were trying to understand how we can address and what caused the solubility. The necrosamide, when it is an aggregated form, we found that it forms some anti pararepa interaction and the pararepa repa interaction. And these interactions are the ones that result to the poor solubility nature of it. And then it was interesting to find that as the aggregation of necrosamide grows and in two different arrangements, then, for example, for the antiparallel displaced, they have a higher aggregation energy, but the solvation energy is smaller. So we found that when it is an antiparallel, in antiparallel form like this, the solubility is lower. But when it is in a parallel arrangement like this, the solubility is higher. If we want to include We cannot hear you now. Hello, Daniel. We have lost you. Hello, Daniel. So, well, I think we love the speaker. Can we? Can you reconnect, Daniel? You th can you hear me? Are you there? Yeah, he's right. I saw him. Yeah, just, just there he is. Hello. No, not your peer. You're muted, Daniel. Can you mute yourself? Hello, can you hear now? Now we can, yes. Uh, you can hear. So, yes, I finish that uh, the antiparallel aggregated system is the one which is more uh, unsolvable, less soluble in water. 
but the battery system is the one which is soluble in water, but is less stable. So if we wanted to increase the solubility of nicrosamide, we need to, 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 to destroy the already established cation pi interaction and therefore favoring the formation of the pi pi interaction in this system. As we observed here that the solvation free energy for this would do increase as decreasing the antiparary interaction. So uh, this is, uh, I would do end up here my talk. And uh, uh, this is a part of the group that we have been working together and uh, my group. So thanks uh, for the organizers. Okay, thank you. Hello. Hello, no, no, we will hear you. Are there any questions? Hello. Hello, can you hear us? Hello, no, you cannot hear us. Daniel? No. Anyway, are there any questions for when he's ready? Any questions for the from the Zoom or maybe in the chat in the chat? Well, I'm afraid we have to stop here, right? Nothing we can do. Sorry, Daniel, you can hear us. We stop the session now. Any questions will we send you by the chat or maybe later? No. Okay, so for both the for both the online and the remote participants, we reconvene at two. Now for the local ones, uh, the food is, as I said, is provided in lunch boxes with your name tag on it, just uh, where we got the coffee. And uh, then for eating, you can stay here, you can go outside, uh, you know, you can explore the surroundings, but please do not enter the ICTB building. So stay in the garden, stay where you are. There is a small sort of, there are some benches, I think up, if you go up the road, uphill a bit, you will find that there is a nice place. Or, but be back at two, two, okay? Thank you.